wondering what the heck is going on. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, All right, I got six o'clock. I'm passing sixth grade this time. Nice. All right, I got uh, six o'clock on the dot. So let's uh, let's call to order the city council work session for May fourth. Uh, a roll call, please, Sue. Councilman Shapiro. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Yarnell Holloman. Councilor Martinez Plancarte. Here. Councilor or Mayor Rogers. Here. Councilor Bacon. Here. Uh, Councilor Finley. Here. Okay. Um, is has Elise or Jean joined? Yes, I'm here. I'm here, Elise. Okay. okay. Everyone's right. present, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Before we go, go any further, uh, since we just heard the golden voice of Sue Ryan, if you all could just unmute your your phones really quickly, uh, we're gonna we'll do this quickly. Are you ready? Now, follow me. All right. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. There we go. All right. Um, now moving on to less important business. So. Uh, council agenda and meeting. Any comments, councilors, on the business or the uh, business session this evening? No, nope, hearing none. What about uh, business items? All right, hearing none as well. Let's roll right into the presentation tonight. We've got urban renewal. Take it away, uh, Mr. Doug Rux. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would first like to start with some introductions. And so we have with us tonight John Bridges who is our chair of our Urban Renewal Citizens Advisory Committee. And we also have with us Elaine Howard, who is our consultant. So I want to start off and provide an opportunity for John to provide a few comments to the council members. So um, I was happy to be asked by Mayor Rogers to uh, chair the committee. Um, many of you may not know that one of the reasons I was happy uh, to do it is that I was the chair of the last urban renewal district and was uh, both the chair of the committee to form it and then the chair of the city um, committee that was developed or uh, appointed to make recommendations uh, to the city even after a renewal district uh, um, was set up. Um, unfortunately, uh, the person who had uh, referred that renewal district to the voters back in the, I want to say the 70s or the 80s, um, referred it using the exact same petition. Uh, and so we tried to mount an effort on educating about renewal districts, which is a tough thing to educate on because it's a uh, tax increment financing is difficult to explain. Uh, we were close to being successful. And so I feel like <clears throat> being able to have another opportunity, uh, both because there's been some rule changes and both because I kind of don't like to lose, uh, is a unique opportunity for me and I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be successful this time. Uh, the last one we set up was in 2001. Um, I cannot tell you how far along we'd be uh, with projects. We'd be in the heart of funding big projects right now uh, if we had been successful in keeping that uh, system in place. So I'm hopeful that in about 15 years, we can all look back and see some of those big projects uh, that the Renewal District has the capacity to fund. And I'm happy to visit offline with anybody um, about any of the components of the plan then or now and, and what the law changes have been. And I know Elaine Howard probably will talk a bit about that as well, Doug Rux, uh, on the, into the future. 
All right, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. So, Sue, you want to pull up the slides? Hey, uh, John, thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, thank you very much, and the others on the committee. So, thank you very much. Okay, Sue, so next slide, please. All right, so what Elaine and I would like to do is spend the, the rest of our time until seven o'clock, and we want to walk through the background, where we're at, what's been accomplished. We want to talk about the Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, discuss the boundary that is being proposed. Uh, Elaine will go through the financial analysis portion of that. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about potential projects and potential next steps. Next slide, Sue. All right. So one of the things that we've spent a considerable amount of time, and it's in your staff report, is you know providing some briefings. So we, we did a, a briefing to council back in late 2018. We provided another briefing back in October of 2019. We have a couple of new council members since that last briefing. But one of the things that we've done since 2015, 2016, is really start to put together a whole series of, of plans that lead us towards the discussion that we're having tonight. So we started off with, we did the uh, Newburgh Economic Development Strategy back in 2016. Then we did the Tourism Strategy then we moved on and we finished updating the transportation system plan, then worked through and completed the downtown improvement plan. In 2017, we updated our water master plan. 2018, we did our wastewater master plan. So those infrastructure functional plans are in place. Then we moved to a busy year in 2019 where we updated our economic development strategy. We also completed the um, visioning program, A New Berg. Um, we finished up the Riverfront Master Plan. Uh, we also did our housing needs analysis. And so that kind of brings us to where we're at today, where we have in process working on our economic opportunities analysis, and then the urban renewal feasibility study. What's really important in a variety of these plans, if you go from the economic development strategy to the downtown improvement plan, to the visioning program, to the riverfront plan, to the housing analysis, and what may come out of the uh, economic opportunities, all of them identified as a potential tool, tax increment financing, which we're generically calling urban renewal. You may ask why. Um, historically, the community has known it as urban renewal. Uh, the nomenclature is changing, uh, but we're gonna keep calling it urban renewal for the time being because that's what the community is aware of from its past history. Next slide, please. So the boundary. Um, so feasibility components have a variety of pieces of it. First be that the boundary. What might the boundary be within your community? Then there are definitions of blight, which are in ORS 457. And it's really dealing with uh, underdevelopment and infrastructure. And if you go back, don't go back, Sue, but referring back to the previous slide, and I mentioned all of these infrastructure plans that are in place that we put together over the last four years. Um, there are some financial sidebars uh, that are in statute. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Again, mentioned earlier potential projects, and we'll talk about a gross number we have backup information. We're continuing to work on those potential projects. And then we have our statutory limitations and we have our next steps. Next slide, please. It, and again, if at any point in time you have questions, uh, please stop us and ask. Sometimes in the world of urban renewal, it's difficult to remember the questions at the end. And Elaine and I are more than happy to stop. And John may have some color commentary as well as chair of the committee. So we have met three times for the committee officially. Uh, there was a fourth meeting. We did an orientation. So the orientation I gave to city council back in October of 2019, uh, we gave that same orientation to the citizens committee. And it was a high level, what is urban renewal? Uh, we met again then on February 10th. 
March 9th, and most recently we met on April 13th. Um, one of the things when we talked about on the previous slide was the boundary. And so that was a, a discussion that uh, ensued over two, two committee meetings. We started with the Riverfront Downtown Improvement Plan and the boundary we had that, which was about 100 acres. Then we took the Riverfront area, which was about 460 acres. And that was our starting point for the discussions. We also then had two connections and that would be transportation connections and that would be River Street going from First Street all the way down to 14th and then Blaine Street which goes again from First Street down to 9th Street and that's what ties the two areas together so they're one aggregate geography. Um, through a series of discussions and it was in your packet uh, we stepped back and looked at what did the boundary look like back in 2001 that John referred to and then we started looking at the edges and typically you don't want an urban renewal boundary to stop in the middle of an alley or stop on the short side of the street you want to include both sides of the street um, did a little bit more refinement down on the riverfront area that was an example where we stopped on the south side of 9th street and through the discussions we went to the north side of 9th street um, downtown is that we went through some alleys and we looked at expanding that down to the south side of third street on the north end we went up and made sure we picked up the north side of uh, sheridan street and over towards the railroad tracks and so there were different maps that are in your packet tonight that shows what the committee did working through different geographies they also looked at an area down on blaine street and that's basically kind of south of uh, of third uh, going down towards the school district's uh, maintenance facility. That area is zoned uh, or has a comp plan designation of high density residential and zoned R3. And we knew in the community we have this issue about a lack of multifamily housing in the community. And so the committee talked through that and they decided that that would be good to bring that high density area on the west side of Blaine Street into the boundary as well. There was one other lively discussion and that was the area up along the railroad line um, where we have industrial, so where PPM Technologies is located, um, where there's some industrial over by Meridian Street, uh, there's some other industrial just on the south side of the railroad tracks over by Main Street. In the end, the committee came up with a recommendation and we'll show you the map that excluded that, but that could be an alternate area to add in the future. Uh, and that would need further com conversation uh, down the road, Pub not part of this particular boundary, but if an urban renewal program got established, there's some possibilities of doing some expansion. Um, on the input, so I talked about the boundary, potential projects, uh, we went through a long PowerPoint, which again is in your packet this evening, and talked about a list of projects that are in the downtown plan and the riverfront plan. And we gave some preliminary numbers based upon those plans at that point in time. Um, started to look at and reviewed financial information. And then we talked about public input. And I think this is important. When we started this program, it was pre-COVID-19. And so we had originally planned for two community open houses to occur. Uh, one of them would have happened in April, the other would have happened in June, um, but we're rethinking that as more of a, a virtual or an online, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please, Sue. So this is the boundary that we've come up with, and so it's the dark blue. So at the bottom of your screen, you can see the riverfront area, and that goes up to the north side of 9th Street and basically goes from over from Shehalem Creek on the west side and extends over to Wynuski on the east side. Uh, we picked up the improvement area where the bypass cuts through, it comes down Wynuski Street and over to Dog Ridge Road and then back down Dog Ridge, uh, follows the urban growth boundary back to Shehalem Creek and then follows the creek essentially um, back to the northwest corner. Then you can see the two uh, I'll call them cherry stems, uh, those transportation corridors on your right hand side of the screen is River Street 
in the middle is Blaine Street. And just to the west of Blaine, you can see that dark blue area, which is the high density residential. And then again, in the downtown area, we went to the south side of 3rd Street. Then we went up and picked up Sheridan and went around the Cultural Center. I should note that over the weekend, my light bulb went on. At the very top of your screen, uh, where River Street and Sheridan Street connect, um, that should also be included in the boundary. When I was going back looking through the downtown plan, I noticed that we had some pedestrian ADA infrastructure improvements that uh, I failed to bring forward to the committee at that time. And so there's possible one minor adjustment we wanna to make to the boundary. Next slide, please. Um, Doug, it looks like Mayor Rogers might have a question. Okay. If I uh, could, Doug, just when looking at the map, I mean, as you've said, this is one contiguous area, right? It's not, it's not two distinct areas. It's one contiguous area okay. and essentially has an island in the middle of it, which right. has some residential and the uh, school property. Right. Um, and I guess just on the, when you look at the map, it, it doesn't necessarily look like it's contiguous, at least in my first glance. So I just wanted to be sure that it was. Um, so, okay. Thank you. It is contiguous. It, it has to be contiguous. Otherwise, we would be talking about creating two separate districts. And that, and that is not our intent. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, statutory limitations. So based upon the previous slide in the area in the dark blue, it's uh, a little over 622 acres in size. The, within the corporate limits, the city limits of Newburgh, were just a little under 3,800 uh, acres in size. And so the percentage of the URA is 16.74. The maximum we could be is 25%. So we're under the 25% limit, statutory limitation. On the assessed value side, um, that area that we're looking at is $159.5 million of assessed value. And the city of Newburgh's assessed value is a little over two billion. And so that comes out at 7.8%. Again, there's a statutory limitation of 25%. So we are under that particular limitation. <clears throat> Next slide. This is where I'm gonna turn it over to Elaine to, to walk through some of the assessed value and some of the financial modeling. Elaine? Hi, I'm Elaine Howard. I uh, work with Nick Popinick of Tiberius Solutions, and Nick is the financial consultant on this project, and I'm going to go through the information. So when we start looking at projecting potential growth in an urban renewal area, we always look at what the historical growth has been. So Nick and his staff put together from 2008 on what both the countywide real market value and assessed value growth numbers were annually and then the city real market value and assessed value numbers. So earn renewal functions off of assessed value information, not real market value information. So although the real market value is interesting, um, it's not the prime factor in looking at an urban renewal area. When we look at that information, we look for um, spikes or things that are odd in the information. When we look at this in 2018, there was a real market value growth of 21.24% uh, and an assessed value growth also of a large number. We talked to the assessor's office and found out information about that and what it was related to and made the decision to take that number in 2018 and do an average of the preceding five years to give us a number that wouldn't be an outlier, wouldn't give us a false um, positive growth number. So we put in the number 4.19%. So when we did that, the a city assessed value aggregate uh, average number over that time period is 4.78%. That's important for us to know because by statute, the assessor may only increase assessed value by up to 3% annually. So that means the city of Newburgh has had over those years, 
um, an average of 1.78% growth above that 3% that the assessor is limited on. So that helps us move forward into looking at some of the other information. Next slide. This just shows what that looks like in a bar, in a, in a graph form. So the solid lines are the assessed value, the dotted lines are the real market value percentages, and you can see that those assessed value percentages stay pretty um, upward at, at, at least a 3% and, and an average of higher than that. Next slide. So that information just helps us think about this next chart. And I know this chart has a lot of numbers on it and I will break them down for you. As part of the looking at the financial analysis, Nick and his team did four separate scenarios on the boundary. A 4% growth, and again, that's assessed value, a 5%, a 6% and a 7%. When we look at each of those, the next row down is what amount of new growth or 3% or, uh, growth and new growth would have to occur to be able to achieve the four, five, six, and 7% growth projections. From those, we get what the total net tax increment funds would be to an urban renewal area. And these are all predicated on a 30 year area. That doesn't mean it has to be a 30-year area, but that's a time frame that we used for the analysis. So the tax increment funds are those monies that come from taxes of the permanent rate levies off of that growth within the urban renewal area. You then break that back down to what a maximum indebtedness would be for the urban renewal area. The maximum indebtedness is the statutory limitation on urban renewal. It is the total amount of money that an urban renewal agency may spend on projects, programs, and administration over the life of an urban renewal plan. So duration isn't the limiting factor of an urban renewal area, the maximum indebtedness is the limiting factor. The difference between the total net TIF and the maximum indebtedness is usually interest paid on borrowings. Interest paid on borrowings by statute is not included in the maximum indebtedness number. It doesn't have to be counted by the city against their maximum indebtedness. The number that's most important to people in the city when they look at all these numbers is what does that mean in terms of the amount of money we might be able to have to actually spend on projects, programs, and administration in the urban renewal area. So we highlighted that row in yellow. So for the 4% scenario, the capacity in 2020 dollars for projects is a little over $29 million. For a 5% Growth scenario is uh, about $41 million, a 6%, $56 million, and a 7%, $74 million. The important thing for us then to, to think back on is the average growth for the city has been 4.78%. We know that the riverfront area is going to have substantial growth over a 25 or 30 year lifetime. So trying to figure out with a city what growth rate they're comfortable using is, is something we're presently working on with the city. We've had the finance director involved in those discussions along uh, with Doug to talk about where you might land in terms of which growth scenario um, you are comfortable putting in an urban renewal plan. For now, it's just information to use when looking at all of the other information that we've compiled. The next few rows just show how that money, the capacity in 2020 dollars, is broken over out over five-year incremental periods. So as you can see in all of these years, one through five is a smaller amount of money. And as Mr. Bridges was saying, it takes a while for an urban renewal area to get going. So in 15 years, this if an urban renewal area would be adopted, the capacity you can see increases every five years in terms of the amount of money that would be available to do projects. 
And in the later years is when more capacity is generated within an urban renewal area. So just for a quick guide for people, if you're not comfortable in your mind thinking about a 30-year urban renewal area and you're more comfortable thinking about a 25-year, you would roughly, and this is just a, a, a gross number at this point, but you would subtract that five in, in the 4% scenario, you would subtract that $5.9 million from the $29.2 million to get the amount of money that you might have for projects if you shorten the lifespan from 30 years to 25 years. So we, we put together this information for review by the finance people, for talking with the committee, for talking with the city council. And with this information, then we also look at what the potential projects might be and what the cost of those projects are. And generally, at the end of a feasibility study, the city council with input from everybody will give us direction and say if they want to pursue an urban renewal area that we're comfortable looking at a gross scenario of X percent. And that, that decision or that information is compiled from all the consultant team, the city staff, um, input from your advisory committee. Any questions on this slide? So Elaine, I might just interject when you're using the 4% scenario. So councilors, if you were considering a 25 year plan, that uh, yellow line that says 29.2 million, roughly that would become, if it was 25 year plan, become 23.3 million as an example. Correct. If you went to the 7%, that 74.4 million would go down to approximately 56.5 million. And again, so that would be the value of the projects, I'll use my words, uh, the projects as they are costed out in 2020 dollar values. Knowing that there's inflation that will have to be factored in over the life of the plan. Right, and that's what the difference between the maximum indebtedness number and the capacity number is, is the impact of inflation over time on your project numbers, because when you put together an urban renewal plan, all of your costs are for projects in this year's numbers. So then when you start allocating those project categories over time, inflation comes in. And so when, when you look at that 52.7 maximum indebtedness potential for a 4% scenario and look at the capacity for projects of only 29.2 million, you're, you're probably wondering, well, what's What's the difference there? The difference is the cost of inflation over time. More questions? If not, next slide, Sue. No, mayor, the mayor had a question, I think. Oh. He needs to unmute. Yep, there you go. My apologies. Um, anyway, you may get to this, so I may be jumping the gun, so I apologize if that's the case. Um, but say, you know, we're looking at an average growth between four and 5%. So in this slide, it looks like 35 million or so um, in today's dollars. But in a later slide, you show that you've got projected project costs of 88 million. So how do we later determine which projects get the nod and which ones don't? And if I jump the gun, um, I apologize. I apologize. I will, uh, we do have a slide, Mayor, and we'll get there and I'll talk about that. But it's basically, it comes down, it's a winnowing process. There's not enough dollars to do all of the identified projects. Plus, uh, you take into account other funding sources that you can pair with urban renewal. So the great thing about urban renewal is usually it can be used to leverage other funding sources. So state, um, state grants or federal money or um, your own your own transportation funding sources. So that project list is a total cost, but it so far doesn't take into account potential other funding sources in addition to tax increments. You're, you're also still uh, having developers pay part of the project costs too. So it's you're, you're, you're adding an extra tool here to what you already have, like your SDCs, your developer, 
the developer carried costs, all of that stuff. So it's a bit of a pie you're putting together from different funding sources to get to accomplish what you want to get done. Any other questions here? <clears throat> Next slide. There are some statutory limitations on the amount of maximum indebtedness that may be established for an urban renewal area. And those are based on the assessed value that's within the urban renewal area. And within this potential area, you could not exceed between about 146 million and 148 million. So all of our estimates are below that. So just we wanted to make sure that you understood there are statutory limitations. We are below that. Next slide. So as I'm sure Doug went over when he gave you your urban renewal backgrounds, the urban renewal tax increment funds come from the taxing districts receiving less money than they would if urban renewal didn't exist. This chart of a lot of numbers, but it just helps give you some perspective of the total amount of tax increment revenues that the different taxing districts would not get under the different scenarios. So you can see on the far left column, there's the four, five, six, and 7% growth scenarios again. And for each of those growth scenarios and each taxing district, there is an estimate of the total amount of money that they would contribute over that 30 year time frame to the urban renewal area. So if you just look at the city of Newburgh, that's pretty much right in the middle of that top set of numbers. For the 4% scenario over 30 years, the city of Newburgh's contribution is about $11.4 million. For the 5% scenario, uh, 16.2. For the 6% scenario, 22.250. Um, For the 7% scenario, about $29.6 million. So that's just saying, you know, if if you use that 7% growth scenario and you achieved that 7% growth, the city of Newburgh would have contributed at the end of the 30 year time frame a little over $29.6 million to the urban renewal area. The thing to remember is that your local school district and the education service district are funded through the state school fund on a per pupil allocation. So although Yamil County, the Extension Service, the City, TVFNR, those are all direct impacts to the taxing district, the state school fund is an indirect impact. So uh, that per pupil ratio that's established through the state school fund is funded not only through property tax revenues, but through income tax revenues, through lottery fund revenues, through federal revenues, and what the legislature has to do when they establish that per pupil ratio is use all of their different funding sources to put together enough money to fund all of your schools statewide using that per pupil formula. So urban renewal anywhere in the state of Oregon impacts that state school fund, whether or not you have urban renewal in Newburgh, that state school fund will be impacted through less revenues from permanent rate levies, but then backfilled by revenue sources from the other sources that are part of the state school fund. Are there questions on this slide? Yeah, I have a couple, if that's okay. Yes. So I'm gonna do some quick math here. No, I'm not gonna do math. Um, I'm, <laughs> that's dangerous. My question is this. So I see numbers like 11 million, 16 million, 22 million, 29 million under the city of Newburgh. Yes. First thing, to make sure I understand this correctly, that's over the 25-year or the 30-year life of the Urban Renewal District, correct? 30 years. These are predicated on 30 years. So over 30 years, the city of Newburgh would forego 11 million, 11 million, 11.3, 11.4 million dollars um, if we had 4% growth inside the Urban Renewal District. Correct. Okay, so is that almost like, could you treat that almost like an investment? Because at the end of the 30 years, the district comes off and then the city of Newburgh would capture, in fact, all of those things would capture the higher 
assessed value, the tax rate on the, the higher assessed value? That's, that's exactly right. So if you're able to put in infrastructure that allows for development to occur that normally wouldn't occur and you get assessed value that's above what the city otherwise might have, <clears throat> All of those taxing districts then get their taxes off of that increased assessed value in the future. So yes, it is. it's exactly that. It's an investment in your city that ends up paying off to all of the taxing districts in the future by providing increased assessed value. So basically what we're doing is we're trading general fund dollars for almost like a, 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 an investment into uh, more jobs and better infrastructure in the urban renewal district. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And one, Councillor uh, Johnson, another thing you're doing there is you're gonna have some um, development around the edges of your renewal district. And so you would expect this infrastructure not only to serve your renewal district, but to serve things beyond it so as you get uh, development or redevelopment just outside the edges of the urban renewal district, you're immediately going to see the benefit of those increased uh, taxes in those areas. Good point. If I could, and also, okay, so if, if it's 11 million in foregone taxes um, during that period at 4%, isn't it also true that you'll have 29.2 in the, in the same projection as your capacity for projects? Um, I, I didn't follow the second half of that question. Okay, so on the last, we had the financial projection where there'd be a capacity of 29.2 million for projects in the urban renewal area. Correct, right? correct. So in essence, you could also, if I'm correct, you could look at it as saying we're investing 11.3 in order to yield 29.2. That's right. So if you, if you look at the very final column that says total general government slash education, that's the, the gross number that hasn't been taken back for projects in today's dollars. But the city is using its $11.4 million and leveraging that $62 million under the total general government education of investment within their community. So in, instead of just having that $11.4 million to invest, they've got nearly almost five times that with the $62 million to invest in their community. And that's the power of urban renewal is leveraging that entire tax rate. Any other questions? Well, I have one additional comment for the council to consider. And so, you know, within the charter, <clears throat> there's a provision to increase your uh, tax limit by 3% a year. And so if you were to look forward and think about that applying citywide, but then it also applies currently into the area that's being proposed or discussed for an urban renewal district, um, if you get to the point where you don't increase by 3%, then at the time that that district is created and that boundary is officially established, you're freezing that, that assessed value. And that's what all of the taxing districts get to share in that frozen base that Elaine talked about earlier. If you went the 3%, that adds on to that assessed value within that district that stays with the city in its frozen base over that 30 year period. Does that make sense? Okay. This Elaine, is anything else? <laughs> Elaine, anything else you want to add? Not on this slide, and I think we go to the next slide, and that uh, moves back to you. Yeah. So, Mayor, this gets to the infrastructure costs. And so where you were talking just a minute ago about 
you know, if you went with the 4% and the 2020 value, 29.2 million. Where we were at with the Citizens Committee at their meeting on April 13th, we were running numbers and it was a little over 88 million. At the time, we were still working through some of the expanded boundary areas that the committee had talked about and we were needing to capture those infrastructure costs. Um, we also had not factored in administration costs, which Elaine had referred to earlier. Kind of where we're at today, uh, fresh numbers, is somewhere around a range of 105.5 million to 107.3 million, not including administrative costs. Uh, we're still waiting for some refinements of a few numbers from our sub consultant on some projects like uh, undergrounding overhead utility lines along 2nd Street, uh, some ADA uh, improvements along Blaine Street and some ADA improvements along 9th Street, basically from uh, Blaine Street over to Pacific Street. Um, as John indicated, we're also embedding in these financial numbers uh, where other sources of funding may come from. So Brett Music has gone back through and is looking at all of our functional plans, transportation, sewer, water, and storm, and looking to see what percentage of those identified projects are SDC eligible. Uh, we're also going back and looking at trail projects that are in the riverfront plan and which projects uh, could be uh, Shehalem Park and Recreation District uh, SDC eligible. We're going back and looking at other funding sources like Connect Oregon, uh, Oregon State Parks. Uh, Brett and I need to have a conversation the next day or two about any other funding sources that might be available. One of those might be the Immediate Opportunity Fund out of ODOT for transportation improvements. And so that might apply to like the Bluff Road uh, or some of the internal streets through the West Rock Mill site. So we'll have columns when you see a final version of this that will give you project costs and 2020 values. Then it will give you SDC portions that are eligible. Then it will give you other sources. And as John indicated, developers are another big source of partnership in order to build these infrastructure projects. Any questions on that? If not, next slide, please, Sue. Let me, Doug, let me, this is Elaine jumping on because it, there was a question earlier on how you balance all of that. And you don't balance all of that in the feasibility stage. The feasibility stage is providing you information and saying, these are the projects, this is a potential boundary, these are the sidebars for the financial feasibility. Given all of this information, do you now want to go ahead and pursue development of an urban renewal plan and those then decisions on which projects and what the allocations are and the winnowing down happens during that actual preparation of the urban renewal plan in the future okay so this gets to the public engagement portion of it as i mentioned earlier when we scoped all of this out in our RFP and in our contract with Elaine, we were looking at uh, two open houses to occur in the feas uh, feasibility stage. You may ask, if it's a technical document, why would we do that? Well, in your packet, uh, you saw that we tried urban renewal in 19, early 1980s, 1981. We tried it again in 2000, 2001. Um, so I took the approach of we needed to have more engagement early on in the process and to educate the citizens uh, about tax increment finding, financing, urban renewal, how it works so that they can understand it does not increase your property taxes. That was one of the messages that was back in 2001 is that it's the division of taxes coming from the other taxing districts as Elaine has already articulated. So then, as I mentioned, COVID-19 uh, came. And so we had to cancel our first uh, community open house. Um, we are talking about, and we have a draft of uh, 
an Urban Renewal 101 piece that is uh, PowerPoint slides that talk and about urban renewal, but it's got a voiceover. Uh, so there's actually a narrative that goes along with it. And uh, just before we had the meeting, I was reviewing that particular uh, body of work that Elaine had put together. And so that's, a, that's one of the tools to be able to get out and get information. Um, we've also put together a kind of the initial fact sheet. And so next slide, please, Sue. So oh, there we go. So uh, JLA, which is one of the sub consultants to the project, uh, we worked with them at the very beginning to get out a two page fact sheet just to talk about urban renewal. And so this was, you know, it talks about what is urban renewal, why are we considering the urban renewal, the sources of the funding, uh, who will pay, um, you know, where did this idea come from? Uh, and again, this kind of takes us back to the different master plans that we put together, which I've identified uh, urban renewal as a potential tool uh, to work to try to create more jobs and in increase investment within Newburgh, within this particular plan area. We had a timeline. We need to adjust our timeline accordingly because of the open houses have been canceled. We're trying to do something that's more of an online nature. We also have in our budget, um, some dollars to do some additional possible video work. If the council was to say, yes, it's feasible to do urban renewal, when we get to what we call phase three, crafting a plan and report, um, is to get some uh, visual aids that are out there, some postcards, possibly some survey work and so forth to further engage and connect with the, the citizens within the boundary itself and as the community as a whole. Sue, next slide. Um, this shows a little bit of the time frame that's there again. We'll need to adjust this. Uh, Sue, next slide, please. So, what are our next steps? Uh, so, tonight is to get feedback and answer your questions about where we're at. Uh, the feasibility study is in process. Um, the piece I was just talking about with the slides and the voiceover, uh, we'll get that finalized here within the next day or two. And we'll get that up on our website. The next citizens committee is scheduled for June 8th, where they'll see a draft of the feasibility study and provide additional feedback. Uh, again, one of the things we'll probably do is pick up that little couple block area up at River and, and Sheridan Street. Um, we'll have to uh, work on what our public input method number two is going to be uh, for the month of June and July. Um, the CAC will meet again on June 29th, and that's where they will see a final draft of the feasibility study, and they will develop a recommendation. That recommendation will come to the city council on uh, July 20th. Um, Elaine and I will both be back. Um, more than likely, I'll do a couple of touch points between now and July 20th. Again, just to give you an update of kind of where we're at, what some of the numbers look like, so that it's fresh because things are continuing to move forward. We want to make sure that you're moving along with us and we're not stuck back on information that's back from April 13th. John, any other comments you'd like to provide? Um well, the only thing I'd say is that if um, anybody wants to have some sort of conversation as we go forward, I'm happy to, to talk about um, uh, the project, both historically and what we're doing now. Happy to meet with people individually if, if they have an interest in that, if, particularly if they're not quite understanding all the terminology and maybe feel lost because of that in some respect. And one of the things to remember uh, is that on the committee, it's an 11 member committee made up of citizens, as well as some of our tax increment, our overlapping taxing districts. So, uh, Shehalem Park and Rec is on the citizens committee, 12th and Valley Fire and Rescue is on it, uh, Newburgh Public Schools is on it, City of Newburgh is on it. 
I've already gone out and provided a briefing to the Amhill County Board of Commissioners uh, early on. So that was pre the COVID-19. So I was actually be able to get in front of them and talk through uh, what's going on with the urban renewal program as well as what's going on with the riverfront plan. And so I'll be reaching out to them again, as well as the Soil and Water Conservation District, ESD. Um, and there was one other one called um, oh, Portland Community College. Uh, we need some touch points, but I wanted to get through this briefing with you first before I start sending them information, see if there was any additional questions we might have to develop. There's some additional embellishment we might need to do to our FAQ. And just to um, remind people, I think there's what, five communities in the county that utilize the uh, urban renewal districts. And so the county's comfortable and aware of the processes for that. Uh, and it just is an example of how other jurisdictions are taking advantage of, of uh, this uh, unique tool that exists. Um, Doug or, or John, do you have the list of the committee members um, in front of you? It'd be nice to, uh, to shout out their names. And if not, I think I've got it here, so. Uh, if you give me just a moment, Mayor, I will. We like to thank them for their service. So um. yeah, I can <laughs> rattle off some names, and maybe then Doug can add in. Francisco Stoller's on the committee. Um, uh, uh, I've got the list here, John. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, Councilor Johnson is the council liaison. John Bridges is the chair. Francisco Stoller is the vice chair. Uh, Molly Olson with the Downtown Coalition, Angel Aguilar uh, representing Finance, Don Clements from Shehala Park and Rack, Joe Morlock from Newburgh Public Schools, Lonnie Parrish as a downtown property business owner, Don Griswold as a citizen, Shannon Buckmaster from the Shehala Valley Chamber of Commerce, and Cassandra Olven from Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue. Well, thank you to you and to all of them for, for, their, for their service on this complex issue. So thank you. Elaine, any final comments you may have? I don't. I appreciate everybody listening. And if you have follow-up questions, be sure and let Doug know and we'll get back to you with any answers. Thank you. Mayor, that's all we have on this topic. Awesome, well, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's, uh, why don't we adjourn and uh, we will ba be back at it for the business session at seven o'clock. And if I remember, the reminder is stop your video, stop your, your uh, vi audio, but don't sign off. So we'll see you at seven o'clock. We're ready to rock and roll if you are. All right, uh, let's do it. I've got seven o'clock straight up. All right, let's call to order the City Council business session for May 4th. Um, for those who might be either leaving at home, um, we do have two city staff members at City Hall, um, Lacey Dykamp and Sue Ryan. If you have comments, send email to ryan at newburgoregon.gov. Other than that, let's call the meeting to order and a roll call, please, Sue. Jean Piro. Present. Patrick Johnson. Here. Elise Yarnell Holloman. Here. Julia Martinez Plancarte. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Councillor Bacon. Here. Councillor Finley. Here. Thank you. All present, Mayor. Thank you. All right, the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to item four on our list, uh, 4A Historic Week Proclamation, and I believe that is Mr. Rux. 
Thank you, Mayor. Do you have the proclamation in front of you to read? You uh, need, need to unmute yourself, Mayor. Oh, there we go. I'm ready to read if you're ready for me to read. I'm ready for you to read. All right, here we go. Proclamation, where is the National Trust for Historic Preservation established May as Historic Preservation Month in 1973 as a way to promote historic places for the purpose of instilling national and community pride, promoting heritage tourism, and showing the social and economic benefits of historic preservation. And whereas the city of Newburgh recognizes May as Historic Preservation Month and supports activities in the community to instill awareness and promote the historic assets in Newburgh as part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This Place Matters National Campaign. And whereas Historic Preservation Month can instill awareness of the local historically significant buildings and landmarks to the residents of Newburgh and surrounding communities. And whereas Historic Preservation Month can promote Newburgh's locally designated historic landmarks and the 12 landmarks listed on the National Register of Historic Places and whereas historic preservation can be a community discussion uniting residents behind an important cause, and whereas historic preservation has been shown as a great way to create jobs, st stabilize property values, and preserving his existing housing stock. Now, therefore, it is proclaimed by the mayor and city council on behalf of the citizens of the city of Newburgh, Oregon, that we proclaim May 20th, May 2020, I should say, as National Historic Preservation Month in Newburgh. In which whereof I hereto, hereto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Newburgh to be affixed on this fourth day of May, 2020. Right. Thank you, Mayor. So we will, Mayor, we will pass on that signed document to the Newburgh Area Historical Society once we receive it. Okay, and thank you. And thank you to all of the folks with the Historical Society and particularly Rachel Thomas uh, on for the committee. Now, uh, the quarterly report, uh, Shannon Bus Buckmaster in the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yes, thank you. So I'm assuming our city councilors have had a chance to review the report that was sent in advance. Correct? All right. So just to uh, follow some of those numbers for the visitor center, we're actually, we held steady uh, in comparison to the year before for both walk-in visitors and website visitors, we are seeing a jump uh, mostly in our homepage visit. And we believe that's related to COVID-19 resource uh, searching. So everybody lands on the homepage. It'll be inter interesting to see how our numbers continue to shift because we have started integrating with Visit Duberg for, um, for the website that they have launched. And I'm sure Leslie is going to share more information on that as well. So I'll defer to her, but we, we are looking at uh, combining appropriate resources so that we're creating a master brand for the Newburgh region, right? So the organizations are cooperating together to make sure that we have the highest amount of visibility for any of the sites uh, or website searches to our website. You can see our revenue is very uh, steady as well. And then beginning in August of 2019, we started tracking incidental visits to the visitor center. So why are people coming in? How is it significant that we have a physical space? What services are they asking for? And so you can see an anecdotal uh, recap of some of the services that we provided. So in-person engagements include several relocation information conversations, bus transit requests, publication services to local lodging partners in preparation for the spring season, uh, administration of the ADEC Oregon Symphony event. So we did see, we always see a, a spike in walk-ins there. Uh, we also had a visit from a Portland travel planner looking for unique, lesser known experiences with local insight and the majority of walk-ins and calls were serviced with a combination of advice, maps, brochures, and local knowledge of tourism and hospitality partners. We still have a lot of people who stop in for the restroom and the average duration of either a phone call or a walk-in visit is actually about 20 minutes. So some are shorter, some are longer but averaging 20 minutes a person that's a substantial use of our staff time to support people coming to our community and recently um, virtually Leslie Caldwell of Visit Newburgh, Taste Newburgh, Doug Rocks and Dan Weinheimer the four of us had a conversation we were talking about how important it is especially as we consider welcoming people back to our region when it's safe and responsible to have a hospitable welcome right so making sure that we're providing that warm small town greeting uh, that people expect for us. So with that said, I'm happy to open it up for any questions from the council. 
Um, we have just one other note here. We, we have temporarily closed our visitor center just for the safety of our, our staff and for our visitors, but people aren't participating in leisure travel. We are still getting phone calls where you can see our website metrics as well. So people are looking forward to uh, visits in the future. We're still providing great services to our, our community in, in other ways. So what questions do you have? Um, I'll lead off, Shannon. Um, I understand from your, your conversations with uh, Dan and, and Leslie, Doug, and yourself, um, there was actually some budget discussion. Was that, was that the case as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we are looking at a, a general reduction of TLT, transient lodging tax funding, which is the tax that's collected by hospitality partners within uh, Newburgh City zip code, uh, incorporated, the incorporated city of Newburgh. So people who visit, stay, in our, stay with our lodging partners, they're assessed a tax that goes into both the city budget and it goes into the budget for the maintenance of the visitor center and for taste Newburgh, uh, uh, visit Newburgh. So, Forgive me, Leslie, I know we're trying to transition that name from Visit Newburgh to Taste Newburgh for the public awareness, so that's why I keep repeating both. So in that, uh, I had submitted to the City of Newburgh and to City Council a break-even budget for maintaining the visitor center at our new location. This is actually a great question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we are still on target to take occupancy of Hancock Commons on Hancock Street on May 17th. Uh, we will be moving into the business. Of course, it will take it'll take longer simply because we're practicing uh, social distancing and safety measures for our staff and in, in what that move looks like. But with the higher cost, cost we did submit a break-even budget that was estimated between $93,000 and $96,000 per year to operate the visitor center. Uh, we're very grateful. Actually, the chamber is incredibly grateful to the city that we were able to uh, include 75,000 of that, that 96,000 in our budget. So to continue operating our visitor center, we will be operating at a loss for the year, but we're proud to be a community partner. And especially as people come back out of their homes and uh, want something that is accessible, local, familiar, or maybe something new and within a day's drive, we want to be, we just, we want to provide that service. So I'm adjusting my budget as, as our chamber is looking at costs, uh, cuts across all sources of revenue for us and we have a diversified uh, budget so we're looking we're looking at that so it's it's about twenty one thousand dollars short but it's it's a year and we can pull together for a year and we can do anything for a short period of time right the important thing is about protecting what makes Nuber great and making sure that we're here um, when we can start reopening does that answer your question mayor it certainly does well thank you Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Shannon, folks? Uh, I had one, if that's okay. Yep. Uh, Shannon, do you expect to see an uptick in walk-in visitors? You know, obviously after everything kind of uh, calms down with the COVID stuff, but in your new location, being downtown and, and more on 99 and more visible, do you expect to see those numbers go up? I do. And in fact, uh, very candid, when I was hired in June of 2018 and began to explore the historical situation of our organization, we, we saw a significant de decrease when we left our College Street location, which was centrally located at a, college, a corner of College and Hancock. We saw significant decreases in walk-in traffic. So we, um, you know, for me as an organizational leader that said, okay, so we're, we lost services that were considered important or critical, and it wasn't like this was 10 years ago. This was uh, three and a half, almost four years ago. So I don't think we've seen a, a substantial cultural shift. People are still looking to access that. But I think, um, you know, there are other points too. We didn't have access to RV parking in, in our current lease location. There's no, there's no place to get a lease in, and now we're a block and a half away from the city parking site uh, next to the library and the library annex and the location for the downtown coalition and taste Newburgh. Uh, we're also in our current location, we're not ADA accessible. And especially as a, just in that ethical response and recognizing that, you know, this is a public contract that we hold with the city of Newburgh, that was a huge priority for me to make sure that we had a location that responsibly serviced all members of our visiting community and existing community. So I expect we're going to see a significant uptick. Now let's adjust that for the fact that people may take a while to get back out of their homes. Um, and again, my gratitude expressing on behalf of the chamber to both Doug 
and Dan for allowing us to, instead of renegotiate a five-year contract for the visitor center, we looked at just this next year so that we can be the best possible stewards of the resources that we have and we can get a better snapshot of what it means to be a welcoming community one year from now. Does that answer your question, Councillor Johnson? It does. And you know me, I'm always looking at the numbers yeah. and, and I just, I get concerned when I see the the cost per visitor um, that I kind of estimated. Um, so, you know, I'm just looking for in the future to see, you know, increased visitors to the visitor center, especially at the, the amount that we're funding the center. So that's just my two cents. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. And I think that's a really fair observation. And as somebody who um, is looking at efficient use of resources and to be a good steward of the partnership that we have with our community, that's something that I'm certainly dedicated to. We want to become a more attractive community partner or a more attractive community and a better partner so that we're using these funds in a way that we're all really proud of. Thank you. Any other questions? This is Elise. Um, can I ask a question? <laughs> um, sorry, I have a screamy baby. I'm trying to get rid of it. Um, so, so I, I, I'm, you know, really aware of the partnership between um, Visit slash Taste Newberg and um, the Chamber, and um, I really just want to publicly thank both of you for um, the, I would say, hard conversations that we have to have right now. Um, amidst the amidst this, uh, pandemic, but I wondered if you, Shannon, could speak to um, just what what different ways you and Leslie are working together to define the marketing strategy for tourism. Um, you know, when I st I was total newbie when we started this work, and um, I've, it's been a learning curve for me. And so, when this work originally um, initiated, I guess I had, was under the impression that the visitor that visit Taste Newburgh would take over the marketing tourism face of the TLT dollars. Um, and that, but I do understand, you know, the need of the physical storefront location. So how are you guys going to collaborate mm -hmm. between the two organizations um, to both be um, a part of the tourism strategy? And do you foresee that being a long-term strategy or do you foresee um, more of a, emerging or shifting to one organization or over the other? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Councillor uh, Yarnell Holloman. Thank you for asking it. So certainly as Taste Newberg continues to evolve as an organization, remember they're so new and I'm sure Leslie is going to speak more to this during her presentation, but as as Taste Newberg is able to add professional services, um, we're integrating that to the best of our ability with, with our organization. And that, that actually speaks beyond the visitor center. We're looking at being a genuine community partner. So as we're able to um, support resources, look at our, look at our subscriptions, our association memberships, uh, even just publicizing their publicity, <laughs> making sure that we have those avenues of operation there. But, um, keep in mind, as we, as we designed Visit Newburgh, Taste Newburgh, uh, it really became a complementary model to the Chamber of Commerce. So we're doing different functions for our city. So there, there's not really overlap in function, it's complementary. So Visit Newburgh, their job is to market and bring people here. Our job is to welcome them and serve them well when they come to town. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a game, it's almost like fetch. So Leslie brings them in, we show them a great time. And in that also it frees up Leslie to become more specialized with her staff as well. So she can genuinely focus on marketing and tourism, which is a skill set that she, uh, she has an impressive resume. She's very well built for this. And especially as they've expanded their staff this year, she's really positioned them to be in a stronger capacity. We specifically removed the marketing component from our budget. So we are just focusing, focusing on visit Newburgh. We wouldn't be able to do marketing as well without more resources and without the special ta specialized talent that Leslie and her team have. So we're supporting that process for them. Um, and I'm sure you know, if Doug Rux especially wanted to speak to the process of the TLT committee and what it looked like to transition that, our, um, our role really was to help Taste Newberg be as successful as possible as a new organization, both in support, but then also release. 
so that we're not hovering, micromanaging, taking over things that they couldn't and should be doing. It's also, it has also been clearly communicated that because the visitor center is time intensive, does require significant real estate, that's something that we were able to partner with because it has been our model for the previous five years, right? So we're already accustomed, we know what the process is, we have the real estate available, we have the reception area designed, and so that's a gift that we're able to, to bring alongside. So Leslie is, you know, a very focused professional can do what she does really well. Does that answer your question, Councilor Yarnell Holloman? No, totally. And I, I totally appreciate that this is, you know, a process of transition too. And so it makes sense to have a complementary model like you're speaking to. I guess I just wondered if, you know, and this might not be the right time to have the conversation, but as we are stretched thin for, um, funding and we're having these larger conversations. I just wondered from a council uh, for other counselors and their um, perspectives and, and, and opinions as a lot of us either were just coming on board during TLT or the TLT shift or are brand new to the process. And so there may be um, other conversations that we may want to have in the future around this topic. Yes, absolutely. And, and as I mentioned before, our intention was actually to to revise and uh, propose a five-year contract and we're on a one-year contract right now because we don't know what this is going to look like in 12 months or 18 months yeah, or five years. Thank you. So Thank you for all your work too. I know how <laughs> thank you. you both have put in. So. Um, what I can also put in too is that wrapped into the visitor's center function, we do have the basic need of promoting not just um, short-term visits, to our community, but we also, we do a lot of relocation work, both with prospective employer, employers, job recruitment, job retention, uh, people who are looking at home buying. We have a lot of, forgive me, Portlanders and Californians stop in and ask what it's like to live, work, and play in Newburgh, and they're serious investors. So that also raises the economic value of our community, even through the capacity of, it's, you know, we're not just maps and brochures. And so we're also leveraging those resources for a larger financial gain for our community, um, which is Great. a bit of a relief, right? Because we don't know when people are going to travel again or when they'll feel safe to travel. I think to, to sort of follow on to Elisa's comment, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things of COVID is we all are getting very used to these, these kinds of meetings. Um, and so I think the question will be interesting to track how much walking you actually get, you know, or is it going to be almost all online from now on? So that'll be, I think it'll be fascinating to, to track. Any other questions, folks, for Shannon? All right. Hearing none. Uh, Shannon, thank you so much. Keep up all your good works. And uh, Dan, item five, the manager's report, please. Yeah, I think this is the latest I've been up to do this. This is great. Good conversation so far, um, and I'm actually going to keep it relatively short. So, you know, the longer uh, we talk, the less I talk. Um, the report, uh, I think you, you may have seen uh, the written report from the last time I mentioned that we'll be doing the sort of larger uh, monthly uh, written and posting on the website. So that has been posted, and uh, that'll be the practice. So I'm going to try and lean a little bit more heavily on those. Uh, report days for being a little longer, but um, really just wanted to summarize a few things that have happened. We've been working on, as you know, on the budget and, um, you know, hopefully are close to uh, completing an approved budget uh, maybe tomorrow, um, you know, knocking on wood. And um, uh, we've also been working on uh, some of the programs, uh, incentive programs that we've had out in the community for COVID response. Um, the Berg program, I think, is complete at this point. We've sort of uh, made all efforts to, to tie money to people uh, or to businesses and to, to hand those checks off. Um, and I think we are complete. Um, the support local challenge was uh, one that we had talked about. Um, this is a rebate program. Uh, that one we had talked about going through April and then um, evaluating the, the success of the program. Uh, at this point, we've extended it through May. We have currently received, as of this morning, I think about $79,850 in receipt amount um, for $32,955 in rebates. And I believe a fair number of the, that amount, although um, the majority went to individual accounts, I think some of that was donated as well. So we're looking to match uh, individuals with that money to, to be able to provide that rebate to those who uh, truly need the, the full rebate as well. Um, 
just a couple of work items for myself. Um, worked on uh, executive search uh, recruiter interviews uh, last week and uh, a little further along in that process. Uh, not yet done, but further along. And uh, that'll uh, be to fill the three department head uh, positions uh, permanently. And then the last thing I wanted to note was the IT master plan. I believe a few of you had had a chance to opine on that with a consultant that we had. And um, they presented that uh, plan to our staff last week. And um, I believe there's a plan to present that to council if there's an interest in that. Um, you know, obviously at some level, this is my view of it is there's, this was an assessment. Uh, we have some planning that we still need to do to uh, come forward and um, maybe it's easier, maybe it's not without any uh, budget to fund it, but uh, to the extent that we can move forward on at least planning for our IT needs, um, that's probably a smart thing to do and um, definitely a smart thing to do, but uh, probably a needed thing to do. Um, and so uh, that would be the next step for that, that plan. Uh, and I believe that is all I have for now. All right, questions for Dan, anyone? Dan, I have one, just how are you holding up? You're, you're here, um, your family's in Colorado, how are you holding up? Uh, yeah, I'm a geographic bachelor. Um, I'm doing all right, I think. I, I think I'm in with the rest of us, trying to, to do A to B and not really deviate too much, but uh, hanging in there and trying to stay busy. You all have given me a lot to work on, so it's been, it's been good. I, it's nice distraction from uh, missing your family. Well, great. Well, hopefully it won't be too much longer, right? So, Knock on wood, yep. Knock on wood, there we go. Um, all right, any other questions for Dan? All right, let's, uh, Sue, how's about public comments? Have you received any written or in-person comments? Mr. Mayor, there is no one in person for public comment at City Hall, and I have not received any written comments. All right, then we will close the public uh, comments section of the meeting and move on to 6A, the issue tracker. And, oh, so and there is one you? item on the, uh, yeah. yep, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. I was just going to say that uh, the one item is the flag, and why don't you and I, I'll, I'll chat with you about the flag this week. How's that? Sounds great. You and I had uh, some crayons so we can figure it out. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, and I don't know if there are other items that the council might want to put on the issue tracker, but I guess I heard a little bit of a conversation around economic development uh, just in the previous item. So I'm not sure if that's something maybe we want to talk about later, but um, you know, I leave that out there that we haven't had a lot of public comment of late. And uh, you know, I understand that's the driver or it has been for the issue tracker, but you know, I, I'm just noticing that you know, economic development, specific URA, but also uh, on the um, community vision document that economic development is a key strategy. So. I uh, just didn't know if that was something we wanted tracking on. What do you think, counselors? I think it's a great idea. Seeing thumbs and nods, uh, we can add that and we can flesh that out in a work session maybe. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, let's move on to uh, new business, item seven. We've got resolution 2020-3667. Resolution supporting the Shalem Cultural Center request to the Cultural Advocacy Coalition. And I believe it's uh, Mr. Rux, and I think it's all night Mr. Rux actually this evening, so. As I was talking with Councilor Bacon before the meeting started, it's a Dougie show. Um, so the proposal that's before you uh, came to us from uh, Sean Andreas, the Executive Director of the Shalem Valley Cultural Center. Um, as your report notes, you know, they've gone through phase one, phase two, and phase called 2.5 at the Cultural Center, and they've uh, invested about $9.5 million in restoration in that facility, improvements in the interior of it. They are now embarking on phase three, uh, which is a project of uh, approximately $6 million, and that would uh, address the issue about the theater on the second floor, the movement studio, the grand staircase leading up to the second floor. Um, Sean has had conversations with the Cultural Advocacy Coalition um, and it's noted in your report, they were formed in 1998 and they're advocating for arts, heritage and history and humanities in Oregon. Um, they are a group 
that uh, receives proposals and does an evaluation on those proposals and then ends up uh, making a recommendation to the legislature. And as I noted in the report, um, uh, the cultural center is looking at making an application and they're looking for um, a resolution of support for their request. Uh, the request would be for approximately $1.25 million uh, towards that $6 million uh, capital improvement project at the, uh, at the cultural center. Uh, so they're getting this queued up now to be able to get the information down to the Cultural Advocacy Coalition so that they can do their review and the hope would be is that they would get, make a recommendation to put that in the pool with several other projects in order to go to the legislature. Uh, in your packet, Sean provided some various drawings um, of the project so you can see the movement studio up on the second floor. Um, you know, the grand staircase going in up to the lobby up on the second floor. They have worked and in the material that Sean shared with me, they're looking at uh, for the $6 million, 12.5% uh, coming from foundations. Uh, the government would be the legislature piece, as I mentioned, 1.25 million. Uh, individual fundraising, 66.7% of the funds would come from that. The, uh, they also provided some material just about um, the various breakdowns on the initial investment phase one, two, and 2.5 um, has created the facility. And some data that they've collected on individuals, groups, organizations, so forth that have have and or utilize the cultural center facility. So what you have in your packet this evening is a resolution um, of support uh, for the cultural center in their application. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Any questions for Doug, folks? You know, I'll just say one thing too is, and I don't know if everybody heard, but the, uh, I understand that later in the summer, I think it's a summer, um, the Governor's Arts Awards will be held at the Cultural Center, which is quite a coup for Newburgh and for the Cultural Center. So any other questions or comments for Doug? All right, how's about a motion then? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I would like to move that we adopt resolution number 2020-3667. And a second? A second. Uh, let's go to Julia. <laughs> All right. Um, any further discussion? All in favor signify by raising your left hand. Left hand. Um, All right. Opposed, same sign. All right, so that looks like it was a 7-0 vote. All right, moving on. Uh, this time it's Doug and Leslie Caldwell. Uh, resolution 2020-3665, a resolution approving the fiscal year 2020-2021, visit Newburgh business plan and budget. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so yes, what you have for you is uh, visit Newburgh, also called Taste Newburgh business plan and budget for fiscal year 2021. Uh, in the contract, it was entered into between the city and visit Newburgh. They have requirements to prepare a business plan on an annual basis. Uh, that's highlighted in your staff report. Um, we have to bring that forward to the city council for consideration in May of each year. Uh, Leslie provided the required uh, draft business plan and then we have some modifications to that, uh, which are in your packet. Uh, and we have to do that in May of each year as well. Um, Leslie submitted all of the documentation she was required to on the timelines that were laid out in the contract. Um, tonight, she's gonna walk through uh, the business plan with the council. Uh, I should note that they do have their fiscal policies in place. So they've got their three months of operating expenses and that's identified in the budget as well. I do need to make one correction uh, and that is on the fiscal impact. Uh, what is proposed in the budget that the budget committee saw is an allocation of $125,141 to visit Newburgh. In the staff reports, it identifies $104,141. And that came out of the conversations between uh, Dan, myself, Leslie, and Shannon when we sat down and talked about TLT allocations for the next fiscal year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie. 
Thank you, Doug. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and council members. Um, I'm pleased to present the Newburgh second annual business plan and budget for fiscal year 2021. I have a hard time saying all those things together. <laughs> and it um, seems like it was just yesterday that we were having this conversation. So for those of you who are new to reviewing this plan, I've included our current board members on the following page, as well as the organization's mission statement and purpose. And so if we could go to the next slide, Sue, or whatever you guys are looking at, because I don't, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so the majority of our board is the same as, as who we voted in, who was voted in in February of 2019. The two changes are that Lonnie Austin Parrish and Jessica Bagley went off of the board uh, due to other time commitments and we replaced them with a couple individuals that we feel very well qualified to serve. First one is Nicole Cooper, who's the Director of Sales and Marketing at the Allison Inn. And then we also have um, Stefan Sarnecki, hope I said that, pronounced that properly, owner of Black Tie Tours. And so we appreciate and thank Lonnie and Jessica for their service and are happy to have our new board members. And then we also hired in the last year, um, in December, we hired Ron Miller, who is our marketing manager. And he works 30 hours a week. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we've listed the mission, vision, and purpose for Taste Newburn. Our primary directive is to maximize lodging tax revenue through cohesive messaging in our marketing programs, innovative collaborations and partnerships, such as the one that we have with the Chamber and Newburgh Downtown Coalition, as well as Willamette Valley Visitors Association and Travel Oregon and many others. And then also resulting in increased business activity and curating a best in practice, a best in class visitor experience. So we will position the region as a desirable choice for wine touring, culinary exploration, arts and culture immersion at the cultural center and galleries, as well as outdoor recreation, such as cycling, hiking, exploration of our downtown offerings as well as historic facilities and scenic drives and agritourism. So we basically create the story through our brand. We tell it through our website, which functions as a virtual visitor information center, if you will. And we target consumers, writers, and social media influencers through a strategic creative media relations plan and trust that we gain fans who will then tell their friends and family all about what great things there are in Newburgh and so that everybody will come visit. So next slide, please. And so as far as our marketing strategies, you know, tourism supports state and local economies and it's going to be a part of Oregon's economic recovery after this whole COVID pandemic passes us by or starts to move along its path. So Taste Newburgh's marketing messaging will parallel with the governor's and travel organs phased reopening plan that you've probably all read about, um, ad addressing crisis recovery and uh, going through a rebuilding phase. And so before tourism marketing can begin again in earnest, the state and city must really meet public health standards and then multiple emergency declarations and travel restrictions must be lifted. And we will focus then on stimulating demand for overnight travel and support for our local businesses. So our marketing campaign will be phased, speaking to audiences as consumer mindsets transition from fear and frustration to hope and exploration. I had an encouraging call today with Pierre over at the Allison. He was manning the phones and he says the phones are busy with people asking them when they're going to be open. So I think that's an encouraging sign that people are starting to itch to, to, to get out there again. And so how will we execute our plan? So all of our marketing is designed to drive traffic to the website and or our social media sites at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And our goal is to drive customers to our sites through a comprehensive mix of, of marketing and public relations programs. And so awareness is key. We will build awareness. We will promote unique experiences. We will analyze visitor interactions with our marketing tools. And our messaging will promote the unique experience that each traveler can experience coming to Newburgh and our area. And we will review how people interact with our website, what blog stories receive the most reads, what images and stories get the most clicks from social media and our e newsletters that we send out. 
So on the slide, you'll basically see the four pillars and the, or the key pillars and the specific tools we will use to accomplish these goals. Next slide, please. And so how will we measure our success? So Taste Newberg will use several metrics to measure the success of our marketing and promotion initiatives as relates to the tourism industry in Newburgh. When viewed cumulatively, these metrics provide a snapshot of the health of the industry and the, the effectiveness of our marketing programs. So in short, we'll analyze the results of our efforts through various tools at our disposal as listed on the slide. So currently we have transient lodging tax revenue as one of our key measurement tools. We do um, plan to subscribe to um, Smith Travel Research produces um, lodging occupancy reports that really help you analyze when people are staying, you know, based on months of the year, days of the week, that sort of thing, to be able to see trends and understand what our visitor traffic is really doing. And then we'll be measuring our website traffic inbound as well as outbound to our stakeholders. We will look at social media engagement metrics and digital marketing campaign analytics, as well as looking at our results of, of bringing travel writers in for stories, earned media, and any sort of other um, commentary that we get from result of uh, hosting travel writers and, and influencers here to the area. So next slide, please. So on this page, we basically recapped, you know, what we've been doing for the last 12 months. Um, we've been basically working on getting the organization operational. We formed our board in February. I was hired in May. We prepared and implemented our annual business plan and budget, which we submitted in July. We set up our accounting systems and our payroll. We filed taxes. We developed board governance policies. We hired a marketing manager. We applied for and were granted 501c6 nonprofit tax exempt status from the IRS. We developed our brand, so that's where the Taste Newberg comes into play. We held photo shoots, we continue to build our image library. We partnered with Travel Dundee on a Wake Up in Wine Country social media campaign, which produced positive results through the winter season until COVID began. Uh, we partnered with Willamette Valley Visitors Association on an Expedia ad campaign in the fall, which generated $24,000 in revenue for the Holiday Inn Express and the Best Western. And we had planned a March through May campaign, again, using WAVA's dollars, as I'll call it, instead of our own money, um, to promote the travel lodge suites and the Best Western. But that campaign has been put on hold based on the COVID situation. We conducted guest service gold training to educate community staff the best practices and customer service standards for interacting with visitors to our area. We had a good turnout with that, with um, a good number of winery staff actually. And then we also launched our website in March, which is probably the biggest lift of the last six months is getting that launched. And one of the things we're excited to, to partner with on that web launch is we integrated Travel Oregon's content through integration with their API. And so any time we update Travel Oregon for any event or any new listing that anybody wants us to put into the system, it goes into the Travel Oregon system and then it feeds through to our website as well as it populates on Visit McMinnville's website. So we really get good traction on anything that we want to list <clears throat> as far as special events and listings in our area. All right, so next slide, please. And so the, this slide really highlights what is the plan that we have for 2021. And this plan was prepared before the full impact of COVID could be known. So this pandemic has dramatically affected the tourism industry, as I'm sure you all know. And it can't be known how much of this plan can be implemented until reopening plans and related phased marketing scenarios can be further defined. But we'll kind of present to you the highlights of it and hope that we can have enough revenue coming in and being able to promote enough marketing activities out there that we bring more tourists in and just kind of pretend like this was always going to be our plan. <laughs> so some of the highlighted goals for our coming fiscal year will hopefully include um, generating at least 50,000 unique visits to our new website, um, enhancing the website's user experience so that we maximize referrals to our tourism partners and capture visitor data, and producing social media and, if possible, targeted digital advertising campaigns to those potential visitors who are suffering from quarantine fatigue, if you will, 
and hopefully in search of adventure, inspiration, escape, and fulfillment. We will produce an, an inviting destination brochure that can be downloaded online, as well as distributed at state welcome centers along the I-5 corridor, as well as our visitor center. Current research tells us that once health and safety standards are in place, consumers are eager, eager to travel again, but primarily regionally and by car. So we're hoping that by having information out there on the I-5 corridor, that will help anybody that hasn't made a decision about where they might be going to stay. So we will produce an, in, and distribute an, in, an inspirational and inviting destination marketing video. We've already got one that's pretty much been produced and we can tweak it without a lot of expense. And so that's our goal to, is to send some inspiring messaging out there to the consumer public. We will produce a monthly consumer e-newsletter and growing our subscriber list from our website and Chamber of Commerce Visitor Center logs, hopefully. We will develop and impl implement a comprehensive media relations plan to leverage earned media in target markets to promote Newburgh as the preferred wine country vacation destination in the Willamette Valley. All right, next slide, please. So this is the tricky part of the, of the whole, whole picture. So as you know, you know, tourism is dramatically down to all of Oregon, all of the country really. So our projected TLT funds for the current fiscal year are down 44% from what was originally anticipated for this current fiscal year. So for the 2021 fiscal year, revenue projections are $125,141 as Doug mentioned. This represents a 61% decrease from what was budgeted this past year and a 31% reduction from projected current year and revenues. So as a result of these revisions, our budget will show that we have scaled back our expenses as much as we possibly could while maximizing marketing expenses to aid in the critical role that travel will play in the recovery of the economy. You can see on the pie chart to the above right, we have allocated 52% to marketing, 32% to payroll, 10% to reserves, and 6% to general and administration. And then on the part, the below right pie chart, it just gives you a breakdown of where those monies go. So 65% goes to the city's general fund, 22% to Taste Newburgh, and 13% for operation of the Visitor Information Center at the Chamber. So you might question, how do we survive on $125,000 per year budget? And that's, you can't, <laughs> is the answer. The good news is that we had carryover funds, as you can see, on the budget page. So you'll see that we had $235,731 in a balance carryover that was came over from the end of 2018-19 fiscal year. And then on top of that, there was 150,000 paid out in September and 114,000 paid out in January of 2020, which is the, the balance of all the unexpended funds from the TLT ad hoc committee. Doug, jump in here anytime if you want to correct me on how I'm using the words. You're doing fine. <laughs> okay, good. And so we consider ourselves very fortunate to have those carryover funds. And we've, we've pulled back on the planned expenses that we had. You know, we basically launched the website on March 24th and had a whole marketing campaign ready to roll. And then COVID happened. You know, COVID happened before the March 24 launch, but they figured, well, let's get the website launched and then let's pull back on anything that's, you know, ad spend. <clears throat> so then, alternatively, we've been focused on anything that we consider free that the, that the staff can do. So we're writing blog posts and we're out taking photographs and we're um, practicing social distancing while we're doing our photography, of course. Um, and we're doing social media posts and we're just trying to keep, you know, the energy going for anybody that's out there paying attention. But the biggest thing is you know, we haven't been able to build the brand out yet and we haven't been able to build the audience. And so that's where, you know, the heavy lifting needs to come in the coming year. And so we, we basically will be using the funds, the carryover funds as emergency funds for the balance of this year and next. Um, because of the way that the revenues are distributed with the visitor center being allocated a fixed dollar amount, the visitor center, the TLT funds gets paid regardless of whether any TLT revenue comes in. So city doesn't get their 65% if there's, you know, $10,000 that comes in, you know, that 
the slice of the pie gets smaller and smaller, but we still have to pay the fixed cost. And so um, with one full quarter being budgeted to not have any TLT revenue in the coming fiscal year, this puts us in a deficit most likely for the remainder of 2020. Um, you might ask, what does that deficit mean? It means that we're spending carryover money and we don't have any income coming in for the balance of this year. So we're hopeful that we can impact visitor behavior to, to prove that uh, Matt and Doug and, and all of us that think there's no revenue coming in, we hope we're wrong and we hope it'll be better. <laughs> um, but we are positioned to be able to survive this year with the funds that we have on hand and very careful spending and very careful um, analysis of our cash flow as it goes through. And so it's a, it's a tough year. We've also, I've, I've projected into 21-22 fiscal year to make sure that, that we do have carryover funds to be able to fund that year. And really the reality is we need to get back to the level of where we were in 2019-20, where what we had budgeted for for the basic TLT revenues in 21-22 to be able to make it sustainable. So it's it's not a pretty picture. Um, and I know that the city's had some hard conversations similarly about you know being down so far on the TLT side of things. And so we're gonna do everything in our power to bring in as much uh, visitor activity as we can to really try to bring that budget up and over what is projected. Okay. So that's it for all of my long-winded talkingness. I thank you for your time and, and, and welcome any questions. All right, folks, questions for Leslie. All right, I we'll have a couple of questions. There we go. Um, Leslie, I'm wondering if uh, Taste Newberg has had much contact with the local businesses and vendors about what they're even going to have to offer when we come out of this. Has there been any conversation about what the, the level of <clears throat> services that people are going to be um, able to give our community and our, the people that come in from outside of the community and how that changes what the marketing is? Um, I'm a little concerned about marketing things that we don't actually have, especially after we are coming out of, out of the COVID crisis. Um, and my other question is, are there any materials geared toward bringing in Spanish speaking travelers and highlighting some of the Spanish speaking businesses and services that we have to offer here? Okay, good questions. Um, you know, I, I used to be in closer touch with, with Molly at Newburgh Downtown Coalition when we officed together. Now that we all work from home, I don't, we don't chat as frequently, but um, certainly, I, I stay in contact with her about about the local businesses and what you know what they're what they're able to deliver you know because if we do bring tourists to town they have to be able to go to an open restaurant or they have to be able to go to you know retail stores and enjoy their experience and so the you know the clean and safe messaging is really the most important thing that we can be consistent with across all of our entities. And so I don't know if I have a direct, you know, yes, we've, we've had these sit down conversations. It's a little too early in the cycle yet, I think for that conversation, you know, but we're monitoring closely what the phased, um, phased what the governor's phase in requirements are, because right now it's, it's not, we haven't even gotten to the restaurant hotel stage yet, so. I think a lot of that dialogue will be occurring in the next 30 days. As far as the second question, I'm going to say that no, we really haven't addressed that as a market demographic. And that's something that we certainly could, you know, look to talk a little bit more about. Thank you. Other questions for Leslie, folks? Uh, yeah, I had a couple of, that's all right, Mr. Mayor. Sure, of course. Um, so I'm looking at your uh, highlights and your objectives for uh, 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. and I'm curious, you know, you mentioned during the, the presentation that, you know, some of these might change. I'm just curious, which ones of these do you think you'll pivot to um, kind of help restart the tourism industry here in Newburgh um, as far as uh, marketing and, and things go? 
Well, you know, when we were in our meeting with, with Dan and Doug and Shannon the other day, you know, there was a conversation about whether it makes sense to, you know, expend value dollars on, on advertising, for example. Does it make sense to advertise when we're not even sure that the, the consumer public wants to come stay in our hotels? And so I think it's, it's very important for us to monitor exactly how Travel Oregon is, is messaging out to the community because it's easier for us to message consistently with what Travel Oregon's message is since they have bigger dollars than we do certainly. Um, but it's really, it's a matter of how soon is it possible that the hotels can be open? Because if it's gonna be another six months that they're not open, then we need to pivot to really shift more of our focus on what can we do for the local business businesses and the you know the wineries and, the, and the, that sort of community if they're able to be open and the hotels are not able to be open but i suspect that they're going to it's probably going to go in tandem and so you know otherwise it's it's really getting the messaging out there that that it's a beautiful place it's it's inspiring people for future travel if they're not happy to come travel, a lot of people are just scared to, to get out and about right now, or even in the next three, six months. And so how do we inspire them by armchair travel to want to come next year, if you will? And so I, I think that's part of the whole PR messaging, you know, really getting story pitches out there to, you know, writers right now are looking for content because there's just not a lot going on. So what can we do to get ahead of the curve of, everybody else who starts coming out with their marketing, can we be out there ahead of that first? One of the other issues, um, I'm kind of a news junkie and I watch the Sunday news shows and on Meet the Press this last Sunday, they were talking about people being afraid of air travel. Um, mm -hmm. And that, I mean, the, the, the time length that they were talking about was, was scary. Um, they said 40% of the people they surveyed said they were not gonna get on an airplane for nine months. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of look at that and I think this tourism strategy and I, I just wonder, is it going to be, you know, I, I being in marketing and in public affairs, I understand you want to advertise when business is bad. However, um, I look at a nine month out and things start hopefully coming back um, to people being comfortable getting on an airplane. And, and I think to myself, maybe some of these things um, should pivot to more brick and mortar, more kind of assistance of our tourism industry here in town um, that isn't so much soft stuff, but more kind of um, helping those businesses pivot to, um, uh, you know, more of an online model or more of a, you know, I, I don't know. I, I look at, you had a picture of Ewing Young and I've, I've been watching with interest how they've been changing their business model to to keep to stay open and um you know i'm just wondering i'm kind of rambling now but i'm just kind of wondering which ones of these things do you see yourself pivoting and are are you open to pivoting to more of a, a assistance to local folks while we wait for visitors to come back well i think one of the important things to remember is, is and I, I, I do participate in a lot of um, research. There's, there's a couple different organizations, Destinations International and Destination Analysts, and they do weekly traveler sentiment surveys that talk about, you know, they have a series of questions they ask each week. And then as this thing progresses, they, they throw in a couple new questions that's more relevant for this time frame. And, and one of the, the latest data points that I saw from last week's survey was that people are willing to travel within a 700 mile radius in their car. You know, the, the, the getting on an airplane thing. I mean, I saw it on the news this morning, what it's going to take to travel. And I don't want to get on an airplane because I don't want to wear a mask the whole time. I don't want to, you know, I mean, it's just, it makes it really difficult. And I think that we need to capitalize on that drive market and really focus on first on Oregon and then into Washington, but keep it within you know, a, a short drive territory where, where we can really, which has already been our primary target market, as it were. You know, one of the things that the Allison is is talking about doing is when they when they do reopen, is 
reopening as if it, it was when they first opened. So dropping their room rates to by about 40%, which will make it a more approachable market for a younger demographic. And, you know, when we went through 9-11, I remember the Nines Hotel had just opened and they were very successful and at a very high average rate. But when, when nine, no, actually it was, I'm trying to remember if it was 9-11 or the recession. Um, I think it was the recession. It was a recession, I worked there. Yeah, okay, it was a recession. <laughs> but they came out with this $99 room rate, which just impacted, like, I, I was in Bend at the time, and I was losing group conferences to the nines because of this $99 room rate. And so, you know, I think it's kind of thinking strategically that way. It's like, how do we really let people know, hey, you could come have this experience at the Allison without spending $500 a night to do so, and while still maintaining their rate integrity. But yes, I think it's also important to promote our local businesses and our local opportunities, even if we're promoting it for day trips from Portland, because if somebody comes for a day trip and experiences, you know, you and Young, if you will, like you said, or Wolves and People Brewery, or, you know, just strolling downtown and, and shopping in the retail stores, you know, they're going to say, hey, well, we should come out next time when we're ready to, you know, overnight and, you know, bring them back. And so I think that, yeah, I think we have to be really mindful every month of the marketing strategies and, and being able to pivot quickly. And, and you can't, you know, having a paid ad campaign, that's harder to pivot than some of the things that we're doing right now. I hope that answered your question. It did, thank you. And for anybody interested in the actual numbers, uh, we'll return to air travel at least four months is 60%, seven or more months is 42%. All right, any other questions for Leslie, folks? Um, I did have a couple. This is Elise. Um, thanks, Leslie. You know I appreciate you. Um, two, uh, I had two questions. Um, one, um, just curious if you could share what other um, people in the industry are doing right now. If, if you have any information on that, I'm sure you're talking to others and travel Oregon and visit McMinnville and um, I apologize if I missed that. And then the second thing is I just wondered um, on the budget proposal, if you could speak to what you're going to be using for, it looks like there's a 25% um, increase in your salaries. And um, is that like a consulting fee? And I, again, I apologize if I, if I missed that. Okay. <clears throat> Let me pull up the budget page. That one I can answer more quickly um the 25 percent increase is if you think about i was hired in may and then ron was hired in december and so basically his salary wasn't even in that uh, okay term. okay got it yeah we're not giving ourselves raises believe me <laughs> so that's hey, what that is. um and then as far as you know if it's we just there was a there was a state of the industry address last week that um, was put on by Travel Oregon and also Oregon Destination Analysts and Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association, and I think they're still trying to craft strategy as far as you know how, what's what are their next moves. They just laid off a third of their staff effective mid May fifteenth, and so they're trying to to determine their new reality as far as they, you know, how much revenue they've just lost from what, what their usual funding mechanisms are. And similarly, you know, I think Visit McMinnville is going through a, almost the same time process as we are. They're, they're budgeting to be down, I believe about 50% in revenue. And if you might recall, you know, their revenue structure is a little bit different than ours. They, they receive 70% of the TLT and 30% goes to the general fund. We were grandfathered in because Newburgh had a lodging tax prior to when the state of Oregon mandated what the what the collection should be for tourism promotion. And so um, they're in their they're in their contract renewal process right now. But I think that similar conversations have occurred about keeping it more local marketing. You know, state of Oregon marketing, drive market. Um, I don't think anybody's gotten into real specifics yet. We're kind of waiting and watching for the next few weeks to see what the trends tell us. Because some of the research that I've seen is, is consumers aren't yet ready for 
real hardcore marketing messaging. You know, they just want to have kind of dreamer, dreamer, you know, so Visit McMinnville is pushing out their videos. They have beautiful videos that they've produced. And so they're, they're just trying to inspire people to dream about when they will come visit. All right, folks, other questions? Thank you. All right, uh, Leslie, I think I've got one. I, I you know, looking, looking at the budget, um, if I'm interpreting this correctly, we're going through from, you know, end of the fiscal year reserves at about 393,000 um, to the end of 2021 or midway through 21 down to 78,000. If we, if we include, um, you know, a rough amount of TLT for the following year, assume we, we get back to pre COVID times, um, am I correct to, to interpret that that would bring in 165,000 for the following year? For, sorry, Sue, can you back up to the previous screen, please? I have it printed out, but it's tiny. Oh, yeah. So, okay. so at the, the bottom column, end of fiscal year balance, 393,000 or 394,000. So okay, well, the good news is, is Matt magically found us another $15,000 on Friday. Okay. So it's now 441000 for total expenses. And then the end of fiscal year, oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong spreadsheet. Hold on. Stand by. Yeah, for, this is the current one. Okay, 441000 And then the carryover is 94000 according to my spreadsheet. So I'm wondering if we didn't update that very bottom. Yeah, I think, I think it's, um, you, you know, either, either way, um, you know, we're, we're burning the reserves pretty hard right? yeah. or, or any of them. So, and what I'm trying to say is I, what I'm trying to get at is if you had $90,000 at the end of the 2021 fiscal year and the next year you're projected to bring in 165,000 in TLT revenue, if things go swimmingly or we're back, you're still going to be well below the operating level that, you're currently projecting. So does that make sense? Am I missing something? Yeah, no, it does. But what, what you're seeing, the 165,000 is projected for year end, but what we had budgeted was 324,000. So if, if and when oh. we get back to the way business was, I put it in for the following fiscal at 320,000. Ah, uh, gotcha. That makes, okay, thank you. That makes sense. Then the, and then that one, brings it to a break even, basically yeah, at the back. end of that okay, fiscal. Good. Oh, good. That, whew, that makes me feel better. All right, <laughs> good. Right. And you might you might recall that we had budgeted carryover at last year's budget. We had an end of fiscal year balance that we were carrying over about one hundred twenty thousand for each of the two years. Gotcha. So we're not shifting. It's not shifting it by a dramatic amount. It's it's it could be a lot worse. Good. So, good. good. Um, and then I, the other question is, I, I did visit the uh, Taste Newberg website. It's beautiful, by the way. It looks great. But I, I have a question, and I don't know if this is just an industry thing or if there's something more to it, but I noticed that you've got, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be too homey, but I'm just that, you know, there's Sherwood and McMinnville and this kind of thing, their sort of attractions are, are noted as well on our website. I'm just wondering sort of why or what's the logic there? Well, you know, we, when we were trying to decide if we were going to incorporate the Travel Oregon um, data, they, we looked at Visit McMinnville and they populate everything in, in Travel Oregon's sphere within 20 mile radius of McMinnville because we know that visitors don't just come to one place and then, and then stop at the county line or at the city line. And so when we looked at our radius, you know, that's where the cities resulted. It resulted in including Sherwood, including, I think, I don't remember if Gaston's in there because of the tree to tree adventure park, <laughs> you know, so we were trying to include attractions that people would come to the greater area to visit. We, de we debated that one a lot, you know, and, and we have the ability to pivot it down any day that we want. You know, we can just reprogram it to just say, okay, we just want to do Newburgh, Dundee, St. Paul, nobody else. Okay. You know, but we're trying yeah. to, you know, promote it at least from a county standpoint, but we did, we did stretch outside of the county a, a slight bit. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions for Leslie folks or for Doug? 
All right, hearing none, do we uh, need a, a recommendation from staff? Yes, Mayor. So what was in your packet was a recommendation to adopt resolution 2020-3665. Any further discussion, folks? I, I do have a little bit. Um, I'm really hesitant about this um, at the risk of sounding overly critical because I know we're in circumstances that nobody can anticipate and everybody's having to sort of scramble to change things up. I'm a little concerned that it hasn't been changed up enough. Um, I think the Taste Newberg website is beautiful and um, I love the way it looks, but I'm a little worried about substance underneath. Um, really around sort of a business model that we don't know if it's concretely generating any revenue, but it's taking a lot of revenue that we don't really have right now. And so I have a lot of concerns about utilizing funds to market when we're in a place where we can't actually deliver any services and maybe money could be better spent to do some things that would help our businesses and our downtown and our vendors be able to offer things when we do open up um, that would draw people here. And so I do, I'm a little hesitant about going into a new contract that we just don't know is going to see any sort of results for businesses or for um, revenue for the city and, and other folks around the area. So I just, it's beautiful and I, I love it. I just wish that we, I wish there was a little more pivot towards providing some things in our downtown area and other places of Newburgh that would get us to where we would like to be when people do start to come here rather than marketing to folks some things that we may not be able to deliver when the time comes. So I, I I'm really hesitant about going into a new year of, of putting these dollars to something where we just don't know if they're going to pay anything out for us. Okay, so Doug, are you going to oh, talk to that or am I tackling that question? You are. Oh, thank you. Well, it, you know, I think, you know, one, it's a three-year contract that we're in. So this is year two of our three-year contract. So our obligation is to, our primary obligation by the state of Oregon, how the tourism promotion funds are disseminated is to promote, is to use those funds for visitor marketing and promotion. And so I would just say that we would need to be careful to not shift it to a Chamber of Commerce model because the Chamber of Commerce is more there to support the local businesses as is the Newburgh Downtown Coalition. And so then, then are we shifting to become what those two organizations are, are there to do? You know, our, again, our primary goal is to put heads in beds and to, you know, get the lodging into you know, the, the various vacation rentals as well as the Allison, the Holiday and Express, Best Western Travel Lodge. I don't think it's realistic to think that they're not, that nobody's going to come stay. You know, the, the, when I spoke with the owner of the four properties on, on I, I call it on the highway, the Holiday and Express, Best Western Town and Country and the Travel Lodge are all owned by the same owner. And, you know, they had talked about closing one or two of the properties and they were gonna base it on demand. And they have kept three of those properties open and the fourth one is closed only because it had a fire and they're not able to, to get it open. Um, so they are seeing some traffic. And so I think to just assume that we're not going to have lodging traffic, I think that's just, I don't believe it to be true. And I, I think that, again, if Pierre's fielding calls at the Allison for when are you going to be open, how soon are you going to be open and how soon can we come? To me, it just demonstrates that there is demand out there. And I think that you know, the sooner that we can can get bodies into these lodging facilities, the more it serves not just us, it, it helps general fund funds as well. And so I, I, I think it's, 
I think it's really an important aspect of, of rebuilding the visitor economy. And, and if, you know, I'd be happy to have, you know, somebody come speak from Travel Oregon or from Oregon Restaurant Lodging Association and they can speak to it as well. All right, other, other discussion, folks? Okay. You know, I, I Well, think I do, I, sorry? I guess I, I'm sorry. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, I, I've asked similar questions to what Stephanie just brought forward. And I think part of it too is just, again, I, I do think that as a council, we need to have a, a joint conversation on the chamber and um, visit Newburgh and, you know, downtown coalition isn't, you know, we're not directly involved per se uh, financially, but I do think just us understanding what strategies we have available as this pandemic is hopefully settling, but quite frankly, probably going to surge again in the fall, you know, what, what we're going, what our strategy really is around tourism in alignment with our, um, our um, our vision our vision document because to Stephanie's earlier question around DEI you know I think that um, you know Leslie wasn't a part of those conversations but as a new council our vision really has shifted to incorporate the feedback of our community and so I would hope that we also incorporate that into our business strategy and tourism strategy as well with the chamber and um, visit Newburgh so. Um, I totally understand Stephanie's hesitation. Um, and I also understand that, you know, the TLT funds as we have it right now are designated for really specific um, expenditures. Stephanie, when you asked your question, are you proposing that some of these marketing dollars be, um, you know, saved for a later date to, to market when we're certain that we're going to be opening back up or what is, what is, your what are your thoughts yeah i mean i think i have a lot of thoughts but um uh, yeah i mean i think i worry about marketing now when we don't know when that's going to be or what is going to be available i also think you know maybe some shift to marketing things like airbnbs or things that draw those funds rather than hotels and things like that that maybe are opening up sooner because of how they're configured um you know i guess i'm just concerned about spending a lot of money that we don't really have right now to market things that we either may not have or do not have available and where those dollars could be better used well we you know we do look at um and developing different itineraries for different market segments. And so we do include the vacation rentals and, or the Airbnbs as you want to call it um, in that, in the marketing messaging, it's all very different. You know, the boomers are more of a market towards the Allison, you know, the, the millennials are more market for the vacation rentals. And then there's a, a whole category in between that just looks for the best price they can find. Typically they'll, they'll lodge in the Holiday Inn Express or the Best Western. And so if, if I didn't speak equally to the vacation rentals, I apologize for that because they're certainly a very important part of, of the mix. Um, but, but I am also very mindful of the fact that 70% of the transit lodging tax revenue generates from the Allison. And so that's a pretty significant statement if we don't get them back on their feet as quickly as we can. Um, I, I think that, you know, I'd be happy to sit down with, with whomever to talk about, you know, Travel Oregon has, you know, there's a whole, and I don't have it at my fingertips, but there's a list of, of visitor promotion activities that are part of that, you know, what that money can be spent on. And so it's not at our discretion to just shift it to say, okay, we're going to just contribute that to the local businesses to get them reopened or, or what have you. So, I mean, we have, we would have to have a very coordinated strategy that aligns with those op operating procedures, if you will, that are, that are dictated by travel Oregon for that lodging tax that's collected. And so, you know, I'm, I'm open to whatever conversation that we need to have, but again, it's just, I, I just feel very strongly about how critical it is to get that lodging revenue back, back moving again. And, and keep in mind, this is, this budget's for 12 months. 
So, you know, for the first six to nine months of that budget, we could be spent, you know, on organic activities that aren't, you know, really putting the, the dollars and cents into it. And then we could push out the more marketing, you know, advertising side of it the last three months of the 12 month time frame. So, you know, if, if we're still in this by, you know, April, May, June of next year, then, then we're really, we got a lot of troubles. <laughs> I don't even know how to address that one. <laughs> we need to come out of, it, out of it before that time. But I certainly understand your concern and I'm happy to sit down with the parties, whoever may be, to discuss how we can best strategize this expense. Um, but Leslie, you know, it looks like your, you know, essentially your 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 overhead costs. So you know, payroll and general operations are probably, I think, if math serves, in the the ballpark of about two hundred and eleven thousand. Um, the the market programming and marketing expenses, if things were really bad, could they largely just be halted? Well, let me look at my budget screen again. You know, we, you know, we could halt any further website development. You know, we still, we have phases, you know, we launched the website, we had more um, development work to do there. We could halt that. We could halt any ad spend at all. We could, let's try to see. I mean, sure, there's a lot of things that we could turn off, but I think that it would just be, you know, I think it would be really disappointing to to put as much energy as we put into creating this brand and then just shut it down, you know. Just say, okay, we've got 12 months into this, and now we're just not going to we're not going to continue any sort of marketing activities to build a brand. It it just I I'm I worry for what that would do long term. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm not you know I'm not advocating for that. I'm just trying to get either you know you use the word pivot or you know how agile the budget can be. You know, and that's just, I'm, I'm yeah. only saying that in, you know, if in the very worst case, you know, we get a spike back up in September and things aren't looking good. That, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at is just the agility that that's built into the budget. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the biggest thing that we're in the middle of right now is talking with the PR agency for a, a one year contract. And so, you know, that would be probably the, the biggest locked in thing that we would have. We're certainly not going to go in and, and place any, um, ad, ad campaigns from any long term strategy and that so that's you know with digital advertising you can <laughs> really kind of push it out fairly quickly and and pull it back just as easily you know print advertising is a whole different story so we've been avoiding that completely just because you're contracted and, and it makes it difficult to to not spend that expense and so it, there is quite a bit of it that we could put in stasis if we had to and, and in the budget, where does that PR contract appear? Where does that on here? On the budget page? Yeah, but I don't see, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just missing PR. It's under media relations. Oh, right? media relations, got it, thank you, thank you. All right, folks, other yeah. questions or discussion? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, if I might, um, oh. Leslie, I guess what's giving me pause is that, again, I go back to page seven in your presentation, and I, I appreciate the, the breadth and length of all the, the topics, but I guess what gives me pause is that there's no specifics there about what your messaging is going to be. I mean, this is a business plan for the next 12 months. I, you know, you've, you've talked a little bit about getting folks from Washington and Oregon to, to stay here but then your website also promotes Sherwood and other places. And I understand trying to promote activities in the greater market area, but it would seem that if it, it just doesn't, I, I guess for me anyway, the, the short term business plan piece, I'm kind of, I'm not sure what that looks like. I know what you had in place and I know where we were going, but right now for the short term and the situation we're in, I don't, I don't know what your message is going to be. And so to approve a budget like that and not know those specifics, um, you know, for example, you can say write ongoing website posts, promote area tourism stakeholders and events. 
we just found out today we lost tunes on Tuesday. So, you know, (laughs) what are you going to promote? And give me some specifics on the next six months. What are we looking at? What, what, what is your organization going to do with those funds that is specific to the situation we're in? And that's, that's just where I'm at. So I'm not prepared to, to vote on this today. I'd love to see Leslie come back and, and give us some specifics for the next six months, just so that way I'm a little more comfortable with uh, approving a budget like this. That's just me. Well, you know, I left it fluid to a certain extent because I think it's so impossible right now to know how to market when we don't even know what the consumer behavior patterns are going to be. You know, so I can write a plan and know specifically what I'm marketing if I know, you know, who we're marketing to and why. And so I left it somewhat vague so that we could pivot as we needed to go through this path. I mean, if you want us to go back to the drawing board and, and dial in some specifics, that's fine. But I think that it's, it's very difficult to know what those might be. But I'm happy to take it back and put some more work and energy into it. All right. Um, any other comments, folks? All right, um, you know, do we have a motion? I'll go that way. Does anybody have a motion that they would like to make? And I suppose that could include, include uh, hearing from Leslie in the future. Mr. Mayor, this is the city recorder. Yes. Point of order. Um, are we going to table it for a date certain or yeah, I, I, I guess I, that no one wants to make a motion on voting on it, but I, I need further uh, direction from the council as to what to do with this item. Yeah, we're trying to get that actually. All right. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I'll, I'll start it off. I'll make a motion that we, that we approve resolution 2020-3665. Uh, the fiscal year 2021 visit Newburgh business plan. I'm going to second it. Okay. And that's a second from Denise. All right. Further discussion folks. I guess I just, I need clarification, like, I guess confirmation that Leslie, that, you know, that this, I totally, I, I understand what you're saying in the sense that you, there really were two paths to take one. That's like a scale plan that's specific and taking a best guess and then one that's more vague and allows you to pivot. But what I guess I just need confirmation on from you is that if this is approved that, you know, you're going to pivot your marketing strategy based on the pandemic and, um, you know, I guess fiscally responsible spending of marketing dollars. Um, I, I feel like at least I need, I, I, I need to hear a little bit more, in that sense, because uh, I'm getting the sense that you, your, your, your argument are, is that if you spend the dollars, they will come. But I guess my argument from a public health standpoint is if they can't come, then they can't come. So absolutely, it, absolutely, and and you know that's one of the re- one of the reasons why you serve as ex officio on our board so that you can know that we have these discussions monthly at our board meetings as far as how are we going to pivot and what direction are we going we actually have a board meeting scheduled on wednesday where we will have further dialogue about this you know as far as you know because you can only take it little increments at a time and 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 you're right we may it may never make sense in the next six months if if we have another surge it won't make sense for us to be marketing in any way that we've discussed in this plan and so Again, if you if you want me to come up with a contingency plan, I I could take an attempt to do so, um, but or I can put a statement into the plan that says you know we will pivot as as market conditions allow, and be as mindful as we possibly can about the expense. Yeah, could we add that to the motion? Uh, Is that sure. possible? I I have a comment to Mayor. Oh, sorry. Go for it, Denise. Oh. Oh, it, it, actually, Leslie, I trust you more because you, you were vague. Anyone who comes to me today that gives me a solid plan is a liar. <laughs> you, 
unless they have a crystal ball somewhere tucked away, it, it's not going to happen, right? We we don't know. Um, I understand that you know we put responsible people on your board, right? And they are going to make responsible decisions. It's unfortunate. Dan probably knows this better than anyone else. You stepped into a situation, and who knew, right? So, I believe that this organization and the board members that you have on there will do the right thing and look at it monthly to make decisions. You cannot tell us today with a straight face what you're going to do. And if you did, I wouldn't believe you. Uh, Leslie, can you re refresh my memory? How often do you re report to us? Is it quarterly? Yes, and I'll be reporting to you in two weeks on the January to March quarterly report. Okay. So and, the we board, the and our board meets monthly, and then we've been having uh, executive committee meetings in between the board meetings since this COVID began so that we could really talk about what are we doing from a budget standpoint and how are we going to, you know, really find our best path. All right, folks, other, other questions, other thoughts? Okay, so um, wait, please, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. I've been, chewing, I've been chewing something over about demographics and the way different people are affected by this. And because my wife and I happen to be retired, our income was not affected. We're surviving people, but there are people at, who are can't survive economically this at all and there are people more wealthy than my family for sure who are just itching and waiting so this is a bit of a risk but we don't want to miss out on those opportunities is what i'm hearing and i don't know it, it seems to me leslie is hoping that those people will be able to make it and and we will benefit from those who are just have the money and are itching to come and taste Newburgh. Um, Elise, remind me what you wanted added to the motion. Oh, I don't know. Um, what Leslie said around, you know, willing ability to pivot the marketing strategy. Um, in coordination with public health recommendations due to COVID-19, something like that. Okay, so that would be just an, an, an amendment to the business plan. Right. For that amendment, okay. Um, anybody else? Well, I did I did comment earlier, Taste Newberg's marketing message messaging will parallel, will be paralleled with governors and travel organs phased reopening plan, crisis recovery and rebuilding phase. So, you know, it's, it, we're basically following those steps, you know, as far as when, it, when those phases move into the next, I'm not saying this very, very well. So, you know, it's a phased marketing campaign based on consumer behaviors, based on, you know, how the, not consumer behaviors, based on viral behaviors, I guess I should say. You know, we can't know. You know, like Stephanie said, we can't possibly know, you know, when it's going to be that the, the clouds, you know, lift. And so, again, it's... So, can I ask a, a hard, just a question and clarifying? So, I mean, worst case scenario is that, you know, really we only have the month of August free of stay-at-home restrictions, okay? If that were the case, then we would potentially see overage because we wouldn't have spent some spent some of the marketing dollars. I don't understand. You would see overage on what? Or we would have we would have excess we would we would have we would have had, we would have unused marketing dollars because the pandemic did not lift the right. travel restrictions. So we would we would see what you're saying is we would see unspent dollars Correct. carried over to next year. Correct. And I think that, you know, you guys have the opportunity every three months when I come to present a quarterly report to readdress 
that, you know, where we are with it, you know, so maybe that your motion needs to include that. Good idea. All right, folks. Um, any other discussion? I mean, that's, that's a part of the, the operating that, I mean, you're reporting to us quarterly anyway per the contract. So I think we probably got that covered. Yeah. But um, any other discussion, folks? All right, we have a motion on the floor and it sounds like the, the part that you were asking for, Elise, is already included in the, in the budget. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Mayor, if there's a motion on the floor, then someone needs to make a friendly amendment to the motion and the maker of the motion needs to accept it. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I, I, Sue, I get to the point where we, we may not need that. So uh, we're just working through that. All right. Um, are you comfortable then, Elise, with, with what you just heard? Yep, I didn't read closely enough. Okay. Um, all right, any, any other discussion, folks? All right, hearing none. All in favor of resolution 2020-3665, signify by raising your left hand. Um, I don't know that I can see. I see one, two, three, four. Um, is that everybody? Did I count right? One, two, three. Okay, so uh, I've got four yeses and three noes unless I heard, unless I counted wrong. Yeah, so. Mr. Mayor, uh, for the recorder, could we please do a roll call vote? Please. Okay, because I'm, I'm watching the screen, but I, I can't count hands. Sure. Um, Piro? Yes. Johnson? No. You're an L. Holloman? Yes. Martinez Blancarte? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Bacon? Yes. Finley? No. Mayor, I have five two, five yes, two no. Uh, motion passes. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you checked me because I couldn't count. So that's good. All right. Um, moving along to um, your request to fly the LGBTQ plus rainbow pride flag for the month of June. And I believe this is Mr. Rux again. Thank you, Mayor. So back on December 9th, Rebecca Swindle came before the city council and spoke to you about uh, flying a pride flag during uh, pride month, which is in June of each year. Um, the question come up prior to that back in June where uh, retired city manager Hannah uh, asked me to do some background research and so I included that material and that was more focused on what about flags, what about pennants, uh, where can they go, what are the city's regulations uh, and I don't want to get into all of the minutiae detail about the city sign regulations because you all go to sleep. But to hit the t highlights, you know, pennants and flags or temporary flags. Um, we do allow flags on flagpoles. And so we have those on public flagpoles. There are private flagpoles that uh, fly the U.S. and the state flag. Um, if you were in front of City Hall right now, you'd see the U.S. flag, the POW flag, and the state of Oregon flag. Um, I've noted in your report that we have a variety of, of, of standards that apply when it relates to, uh, to flags. And so we have definitions of what a flag is. We have definitions of what a portable sign is. We have definitions on what a sign generically overall uh, encompasses. And so I listed all of that out. You no, know, the bottom line is, can you have flags? Yes. Can you have pennants? Yes. Can you have banners? Yes. Uh, there are different regulations that apply to, to each one. Um, I also then noted in the report that uh, we have a provision under 15.435.100 on flags that an unlimited number of flags are permitted on Memorial Day, President's Day, Independence Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, Flag Day, Peace Officers Day, the Friday of the Camellia Festival, and the Friday of the Old Fashioned Festival or any festival day designated by the Newburgh City Council. So that one's, um, that last piece leaves it kind of broad and open. The city has six flagpoles. 
We got the large one down at the east end of the couplet uh, where that flag changes out. We fly the smaller flag during the winter months and the larger flag during the summer months. Winters, because of the rain, the flags get heavier. Uh, there's a whole structural set of issues with flagpoles. We've got the one I mentioned previously here at City Hall. We've got one at the police department. We've got one at Francis Square, one at the wastewater treatment plant, and one at the public works maintenance yard. Um, some of our flagpoles, uh, well, we, we fly the three flags, like I mentioned, the US, the POW, and the state of Oregon flag. We went and did some research in the past, and the Department of Administrative Services has some protocols as well on flags. Uh, I provided the link in your report. I also provided the specific language uh, from their policy, and their policy does apply to cities, towns, and municipal corporations. They also, in their material, they talk about the size of flags based upon the height of the flagpole. Should note that all flagpoles need a, a building permit because there's structural integrity to, to uh, fly a flag off of a particular pole. Um, also includes some information uh, from the U.S. Code, for U.S. Code, Chapter 1 on the flag. The one is applicable to this discussion is subsection F. Uh, when flags in state, cities, or localities, or pennants of societies are flown on the same halyard with the flag of the United States, the latter should always be at the peak. So that's basically U.S. flag always goes to the top. If you have a series of flagpoles, still the U.S. flag is the one that flies the highest and then it's kind of the hierarchy that goes down from there. So as you can see, we have local regulations, we have state policy guidance, and then we've got US code provisions as well. Um, I outlined several policy considerations for the council on this discussion. Um, one of those being uh, uh, if we fly, pull a flag on our poles in addition to the US or Oregon flag, it, it's a policy issue of the city council. Uh, what criteria does Newberg use for adding any flags or pennants to the city flagpoles? We don't have any policies in place, so we've got some code criteria. Um, financial impact of new flags, the resizing, you know, if you're going to add additional flags onto an existing pole, that means smaller flag, there's a financial consequence to that. Um, if we have a flagpole that's not tall enough to be able to uh, to go through the protocols of the uh, US POW and uh, the state flag, uh, there's a cost to replace flag poles or add additional flag poles. Um, uh, you know, should we have a, a system for Newburgh flying our city flag and any other flags on a pole that's, that's separate? So this gets to, we have the city flag. Um, if we were allowing other types of flags, should there be a separate flagpole that address that? And that kind of takes you back to the hierarchy in the U.S. code, if you have multiple poles. Um, I mentioned the section in our code on flags, and could that be modified to include the pride flag? Um, last on this one is that City Attorney Stone did some research, which I included in your packet, um, that came from two cities in California addressing the issue of the pride flag, and that was Costa Mesa and the city of Santa Ana. And we've included those as attachments two and three where their councils looked at, at and came up and developed some policies related to uh, flying a pride flag. I think the last one uh, that I might add, and I didn't have this in the original, is here we are at the first of May, pride month is coming in June. Uh, social distancing protocols are in place. We have not reopened. Um, could there be that the city council adopts a proclamation? This is the kind of the first step to all of this. And could that be done at your first meeting in June or our second meeting May 18th in May on a proclamation? Uh, another one would be um, banners on private buildings. Um, those are allowed. Um, those who are interested in having a pride banner rather than a flag, could they work with individual businesses in order to get approval to have a banner on their on their building? So that's what I have to start the uh, discussion, Mayor. All right, thank you. A question for Truman. Truman, when when looking at the the, the 
resolutions in other communities. Did you find anything in Oregon? Uh, I did not, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't look at every city code in Oregon, so there may be one or more out there that I did not find. But in doing um, what essentially was a internet search based on words, I did not find any in Oregon. Okay, thank you. All right, questions for Doug or for Truman, folks. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a comment anyway from, from looking at, and I guess which, what am I looking at? I'm looking at Costa Mesa. And they, they term these as being commemorative flags, number one. So, um, and it's something um, that, and it says clearly that the city's flagpoles are not intended to serve as a forum for free expression by the public. Rather, the city's flagpoles are to be used exclusively by the city, where the city council will display a commemorative flag as a form of government expression. So, you know, I think it's interesting this evening, um, you know, as, as Doug mentioned, we, we proclaimed National Historic Preservation Month. And so in theory, if the National Historic Preservation folks had a flag, that could be something commemorative that we could fly. But instead, we went with a resolution. So, I don't know, comments, folks, I just found that timely. Mr. Mayor, can I just address one thing on that? Sure. <clears throat> so looking at uh, the Costa Megas uh, policy, so that Section 8 com commemorative flags, mm -hmm. um, subsection B says, makes it clear that the flagpoles are not intended to serve as a forum for free expression by the public. And then it states the city will not display a commemorative flag based on a request from a third party, nor will the city use its flagpoles to sponsor the expression of a third party. So one of the things, <clears throat> one of the issues is once you, if, if a third party, a, the historical society or, or uh, Seahawks fans or anybody came and asked the city to fly a flag for some group, um, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to craft a policy where the city council could then, or city staff, uh, select based on the content of that speech. You would essentially create a public forum and whoever had a flag that wanted to fly the flag would bring it and the city would essentially be obligated to fly it. Um, these policies, the two from California, made it very clear that they aren't responding to third party requests, that the policy is um, a expression of the city's speech, not a third party. So they adopted a specific policy that requires the council to take a vote on what flags, you commemorative type flags that the council wants to fly. And then uh, the, then that is speech of the city expressed through the council's action and not a third party speech. So it's a little different than what you described about the historical society. Uh, well, but the counter argument to that would be that we did have a request from a specific individual that could be determined to be a third party. So, yes. Okay. So that's, that's right. really kind of what started this whole process. Exactly. So, all right, folks, um, other comments or discussion on this, on this item. I mean, this may be like a can of worms, but isn't it like a really crazy idea if we were to do something along those lines to get an idea of like a sensing session from community members of what flags would be requested to be flown? And then I guess we would vote on that. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there. Obviously, can you tell I want the pride flag flown? <laughs> Well, I think it's the opposite, right? We wouldn't solicit a third opinion. We would 
form our own opinion as the council whether or not it's a statement of our beliefs or wishes to have it flown. No, I get that, but I guess what I was thinking is like, are there flags that are important that we would support that we aren't, that we wouldn't have the forethought to think of, you know, and that we're excluding them based on just knowledge base of, of not, of oversight, you know? And then to go along with that, Mayor, if I may. Of course. Um, so then what kind of legal obligation does that, I mean, it, it just seems like picking fights with people. Um, if you only, if you only do what you believe, and then discount the people that you don't believe. I just, while I would love to fly a lot of flags, I just worry about how it makes other people feel. I'm not speaking of this flag particularly, but a flag in general. Other thoughts, folks? Well, um, one of our goals was diversity, equity, and inclusion. So does that involve the gay people of the LGBT community? Absolutely. But it, it, and, but if somebody comes along with another idea, would, would, would that trip us up then? Says with another group. I guess that's what I was asking Truman. Like yeah. where does... Well, if you, if you look back uh, at that email I sent, I think it was December. Um, and I, it's been a little bit since I looked at that again. There was a uh, city of Boston actually got, um, uh, I think it was the pride flag they flew and then someone else came and requested, uh, and I don't even remember what the group was and the city declined to fly that flag and that ended up in court and I'm not sure what the status of that litigation is. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even have to be anything really offensive or hate speech, but if you decline yeah. someone else's flag, it, it could be commercial advertising. You know, I mean, if once you open the forum, you cannot, you, your ability to, to make a judgment based on the content of that speech goes out the window. It, it becomes a public forum. Um, if, if you were to create that public forum. So one of the options like Doug was talking about was potentially the city could install a flagpole somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where, I mean, that's a logistical question, but you could install, the city could install a ceremonial flag pole and then make, make it open to groups and you'd have a, you know, we'd have to create some policies, some regulations, um, you know, they may, I, you know, I don't know if there's a fee, but they fill an application, they reserve, and, you know, we fly whoever flag wants to be flown. Um, that is one option on the, on the public forum side. Now, we wouldn't, I, I don't think we could do that in conjunction with the U.S. POW and state flag because those are governed by specific federal and state statutes that were bound to follow but you could do it that way the if if the council wanted to as an expression of the council's intent fly a commemorative type flag whatever that be um, at the council's in, instigation you could do that uh, and then we would need to have in my opinion we need to have a policy similar to what Costa Mesa or, or um, uh, let's see, what was it? Santa Ana, I think. Actually, I think we were looking at Santa Ana Mayor, not Costa Mesa's, but um, you could do that, but then it, it would have to really kind of generate organically from the council, not come as a request from third parties. All right, further thoughts, folks? Uh, maybe I should just throw in another question. 
I am a PFLAG member and financial supporter, but not a board member. Is that something that should be disclosed if, if we move ahead with this particular one? Does that matter? Uh, I don't, my opinion, it's all, oh, Chairman, you'd be, you should answer that one. I mean, should it be disclosed? Um, well, it, it certainly doesn't hurt to disclose those sorts of things. It's part of like, uh, if we were having a hearing, which we're not, uh, when the mayor asked for um, declarations of bias or something like that, but uh, under Oregon government ethics code, there has to be a financial component to create a conflict of interest, either an actual or a potential conflict of interest. So, meaning that, meaning that I take money from them. Meaning that it, the public official needs to determine if the decision that the public official is going to participate in would either create a, pub, a financial benefit to the public official or avoid a financial loss to the public official. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Patrick. So I had a couple thoughts and um, let me collect them. Uh, the, the first one was I looked in the, the policy considerations on page seven of the staff report. Just from a nuts and bolts standpoint, um, I don't, Okay, do we want to resize the flags so we can fit a fourth one on there? I mean, I'm just I'm logistics. Do we want to put up new poles? And how, I mean, that, I, I'm just wondering about the logistics of this thing. Um, because, so there's, there's that piece of it. The other piece of it is I did a quick internet search um, when this came in the packet and the city of Boston um, flew the, the gay pride flag, the P flag. And um, they have also flown 284 other types of flags. Uh, they actually put up a, a separate flagpole for um, different, um, they called them, what did they call them? They called them, uh, they called it government speech and they said that they could do that because most of them were um, of other countries and also um, uh, events and uh, historical kind of events, you know, like the, the commemorative month for um, LGBTQ um, folks. So um, they, were challenged in court, like Truman said, by the uh, they want a group wanted to fly the Christian flag, and the judge in Boston did um, say that that they the you, the Boston didn't have to fly that flag because it was basically promoting a religion. Um, so that's so the way I see it is that um, I I think we're allowed to do it. I don't think. You know, I think if we have a, a, a decent enough policy, and, and I and liked the two that, that Truman gave us, um, my thing is just how and where and when in the process of this. Because my concern is not so much that, you know, can we or can't we, it's how. Um, and right now, I don't see a clear path without spending some money. And I'm not sure that's something we want to do right now. But um, I also think that, you know, in the past, businesses and, and uh, folks have put up the flag around town. Maybe this year we promote that um, uh, individually. But um, I just, yeah, that, I'm just really torn on um, the how of this thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a, at least a, a, well, a proposal, I guess, or a suggestion, particularly to give staff some, some direction. I, I'd like to propose that we get a draft um, proclamation for this coming June. Then I would like to see after that, that if there is really an appetite in the community for a flagpole to, to you know, present flags of all nations and all beliefs, um, that we see who in the community might like to help pay for that flagpole and determine where we might like to locate it. Um, 
I think we turn it back to the community and, and yes, it'll be government, we'll make the choice, but I, I think if it's, if it's important enough to, to our community, we let them weigh in. Um, but that's, so that's my, my thought at the moment. Excellent suggestion, sir. Would that uh, be on site? I'm presuming if you're uh, having the community pay for it and, and uh, own it, that it would be located off city property, correct? Uh, yeah, potentially wherever that may be, whether, you know, whether we do it in Memorial Park or whether it's in Butler property across the street or, or whatever. But yeah, I would say probably not on the building would be, would be my guess, just because of the logistics, as Patrick was saying, of just simply another flag, resizing, all that kind of stuff. And then we'd have a place where it was really sort of a, a spot for the community to, to show off what we believe in. Oh, maybe Stephanie could take this to the cultural district. Wait. <laughs> yep. I can do that. I also wanted to add that, of course, just to add a little bit because I can't not, I would also like to see a proclamation to make May 22nd Harvey Milk Day. Um, it, you know, definitely reading that packet, I was like, yep, that's, that's also something I would be interested in doing. Right. Yep, I agree, definitely. Um, so how does that sound for this sort of preliminary step, folks? Does that work? Thumbs up, maybe nod, we'll give the staff. Um, it looks like you're getting, looks like, Doug, you're getting a thumbs up, as far as I can tell. All right. All right, any, all right, we good with that? All right. Um, how's about uh, committee, re is that, sorry, Doug, is that, is that good enough direction? Well, what, uh, Mayor, what I'm hearing is, come back with a proclamation. So do you want that on May 18th or you want that on June 1st? What's your work schedule like? Uh, I didn't even ask that question. That's a did, you, did you really want to ask Stupid that? Question. I think we could probably get someone else to write it. Okay, all right, good, all right, all right. I don't, May 18th would be great if you got time. That'd be great. Then, well, I thought uh, I heard two. Like, yeah, and there was two pieces to that. Well, I heard, I've heard three. One is come back with a proclamation, so I'm hearing that on May 18th. The second one is have a conversation with the community about where to have a poll and community members paying for that. So that's a longer term issue. Right. And then I heard from Councillor Finley is to come back with a proclamation uh, on, for May 22nd uh, for Harvey Milk Day as well. So I, I'm, what I'm hearing is two proclamations on May 18th, and then a longer community conversation about where to put a poll. Right. Right. So I might add one thing that we, it, would it be possible to invite back Rebecca Swindle um, to May 18th to this Zoom call, um, just in follow up to their our initial request? Yeah, I think that would be great. And further, I think it would be great if we, if we bring it up with organizations like PFLAG um, and help them help us get this moving. Yep, exactly. Yep, all right. Cool, all right, sound good? Okay, all right, let's go on to council committee reports. Anyone, things have been, yeah, a lot of, lot of virtual stuff, so. Um, I'll start. I'll start off. Then uh, we've been still keeping the weekly calls going with community partners, um, and actually, I thought we'd be having some fatigue by now. But but people continue to dial in, so that's good. And it's uh, you know a lot of the major partners, so Providence and Virginia Garcia, and the health side, and then uh, major businesses, ADEC, DCI, uh, then school district, Parks and Rec, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, it's been well attended, and I think. You know, we, I do a, a weekly little video deal that doesn't seem to be getting too many views, but at least these partner calls seem to be, um, the, the folks participating seem to be enjoying them and there have been ways to exchange information and try to help each other out. So that's been gratifying. Um, the other ones that I'm doing downtown- Can I say something about that, Rick? Yes, of course. I just, I think it's amazing that you're doing all that. I just really want to give you a public acknowledgement for that. And, um, not to put more pressure on you, but I really think that that one of the silver linings of COVID are things like what you're doing. And I would really think that we would want to continue those 
ongoing conversations in the fashion that you have been. So thank you so much for stepping up in the way that you have. Well, well thank you. And, and, you know, thanks to, you know, thanks to, to Dan for being in on those calls and Truman um, and um, 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 uh, who's or, uh, Bob, uh, Karen Tarmichael for, for, for organizing us and all. Um, and, and also your little video that, that helps. Yeah. The videos you've been doing, which some of us then share with our friends on Facebook or whatever. Oh, well, good. All right. Well, if you ever have suggestions for that kind of stuff, please, you know, please let me know. Um, and we'll try to, I think I got off the track a little bit into the budget details and probably bored a few people to tears, but sorry about that. So I do uh, have one suggestion. Yes. You need the light on your face, not about, not on the back of your head. Yeah, which it is like right now, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I will, I will work to do better with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so, and then otherwise meetings, uh, downtown coalition continues to do their video meetings, league of Oregon cities. We've been on pretty much weekly with that. There's a countywide thing that Casey cool has been organizing that I've been on periodically. Um, and then the chamber is meeting, I think tomorrow afternoon. So those are the ones that I've been sort of trying to keep an eye on. Um, any, anything else on that folks? All right. Um, next, I think we've got committee openings and Sue was kind enough to prepare a release. I think Sue prepared it or, or Lacey or both. Um, Sue, did you want to mention that or? or... Yes, sir. Uh, right. So for any of those um, uh, who know a teenager or uh, someone in college or high school, we are recruiting for two student commissioners. We need one student commissioner for the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, they identify, recognize, and preserve significant properties related to the community's history, and they meet quarterly. And we need one student for the Traffic Safety Commission. Uh, the Traffic Safety Commission is to promote traffic safety through investigation, study, and analysis of traffic patterns. We also need one adult for the Traffic Safety Commission. I'm glad to say I heard from our planning student commissioner today, Colin Bolick, who said that he would, he would send it to some people at the high school, and Lacey has kindly um, put it out on social media and made me a slightly more current poster than my Retro's 80 design style there. So um, applications are available on the city's website, or if someone does want to come fill one out in person, they just need to contact me and I'll set up an appointment to meet with them. So if you know of anyone or could just um, pass that along, um, we depend upon our committee members to help our commissions um, do the city council's work. And that's it for me. Well, so and you know that that 80s look is coming back. It's gonna, you know, and is that just because you're showing your age? Is that it? Is that why you're thinking about that? I am of a vintage age. Well, yes, you are vintage indeed. All right. Anything else for that? So yeah, so it is. I mean, in, we have historic preservation. It is it's National Historic Preservation Month. It's a very good time to get out there and find a uh, commissioner for that. So all right. Anything else? Oh, and, and I should say we've also got traffic projects coming up that uh, traffic safety would certainly want to be involved with. So there you go. Um, anything else for the good of the order, folks? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir, Truman. Well, actually, I had a question for Councillor Johnson. Uh oh. <clears throat> Recognizing that today is Star Wars Day, you know, <laughs> May the 4th, nice. I'm wondering what happened to Han Solo. Well, you know, this is a city council meeting and I felt there needed to be a little more gravitas. So <laughs> Han Solo is over here. Right, right. Hmm. Okay, I, ha I have a confession to make about my committee meeting that I missed. Uh, the Economic Opportunity Commission I had, committee I had trouble with my internet and with the app, but I have that resolved. So I'll be there on the next one. Yes, and actually speaking of which, I need to make a public apology to uh, Mayor Bob and to Dan for missing a call this morning and to Sue Truman and Dan for being late on a, uh, a run through call this afternoon. It was uh, one of those days. So, um, so yes, happy Star Wars days. Uh, tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo. So all y'all, you know, get out there. No, no, stay home, stay home and don't go out. So anyway, all right. Budget Otherwise, committee. 
Anything else? All right, y'all. Have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow night. So tomorrow night it is. Yeah. Can't wait. That's right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, right. move we adjourn. Oh. See ya. We're adjourned. See ya. I second it. <laughs> uh.